And now I should just turn the mic on. Do I need to repeat that introduction? Again, my name is Gary Miller. I'm the Vice Dean of Research Strategy and Innovation. Um, so this is a very exciting opportunity, one for me, as I have been here for just under two months, um, learning about all the great things that are happening here in the School of Public Health. Um, and this is personally something that I have an interest in, in being an environmental health um, scientist around issues of climate. Um, but also on the food systems and nutrition, uh, more of a lineage thing is my, my grandfather was a plant pathologist at the Department of Agriculture for many years, um, worked with George Washington Carver on many different collections. My father was a dairy scientist and worked on livestock insect control at USDA. And my wife worked at USDA as a poultry veterinarian developing um, 
uh, vaccines and things. So I've had my sort of family has been involved in, in USDA sort of activities around health. And so I've always had that great appreciation of what goes into it, but also thinking about how the interaction with the environment is very critical. Um, I'd also, uh, I was talking to the dean, she's traveling right now, and she was very excited, and she was like, make sure you tell them about, all, and she sent me this really long list, I'm not going to go through and read it, but as you know, we have, you know, we're involved in teaching courses around food systems in the undergraduate uh, curriculum, we have many activities around the climate and health program and other food systems and security, is that this is a theme that really goes across the entire school, so you know, while a lot of the energy is coming out of environmental health sciences, it's something that the entire school and the dean um, is, is very enthusiastic about. And so it's, it's, really, uh, it's really my delight to be able to be here and learn about all these great things that are happening. Um, as you can see, there's a, a great program here uh, lined up, um, a combination of, uh, you know, a, a, a distinguished lecture, um, a very nice panel for discussion and time for reception. I think there'll be some really great time for interaction um, and again, going back to my role as, as Vice Dean of Research Strategy and Innovation, I think these are sort of innovative approaches where you bring these teams together, really, really advance um, public health uh, in many great ways. And so I look forward to uh, um, hearing all that, and I now turn it over to my next <laughs> moderator. Thank you, Gary. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Lisa Goddard. I am the director of the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, or the IRI. Uh, to give you a little background on the IRI, um, we were established within the Earth Institute here at Columbia University a little over 20 years ago now. And we've been working on these types of intersections, nutrition and climate, and climate in other areas as well. So about half of our scientists are climate scientists, and the other half of our scientists are sectoral experts. And we work together on how to bring that information into, into problems, into real world problems, particularly with vulnerable communities um, that are struggling with the impacts of climate variability and climate change. Um, <clears throat> the opportunity to collaborate through this Columbia World Project is tremendous. So IRI is bringing climate expertise and that bridging expertise working together with the Columbia um, University Medical Center and also the Mailman School of Public Health is a real great opportunity to work together on these, these issues where we both have very deep expertise in the problem. The Columbia World Project that we're collaborating on and that's um, the motivation for today's uh, book launch and workshop, this is the first Columbia World Project. There will be many more. Uh, this is called Adapting Agriculture to Climate Today for tomorrow, and we've shortened that to ACT Today. So you might hear this acronym ACT Today um, a few times um, through the afternoon. The main goal of our project is the Sustainable Development Goal number two, which is on reducing hunger. So the goals there have to do with reducing food insecurity, so improving food security, um, making agriculture more sustainable, and improving nutrition, and thus this workshop and the emphasis of the discussion that you're gonna hear today. So together, you're going to, uh, we're going to work on improving nutrition through the application of climate information, climate services. In six countries, we have representatives from five of those six countries, those countries being Guatemala, Colombia, Senegal, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. We have great partners that we're working with in those countries together with great international partners and great collaborators here at Columbia University. So together, the climate, the nutrition, the health, and the health institutes, um, we believe we can make some real progress on this issue of improving nutrition under SDG2 and advancing the whole field of climate and nutrition, which is really a frontier. So thank you for being part of this event. So uh, I'm Richard Deckelbaum. I'm director of the Institute of Human Nutrition. Uh, I don't have the same pedigree as Gary did when he introduced himself, but both my parents loved food. <laughs> uh, and I'll be giving a little bio on myself a bit later, but um, I just want to point out, like the IRI, the Institute of Human Nutrition 
is not a department of nutrition. And that means that we really bring together faculty, uh, outstanding faculty from, different, from 20 different departments, public health, clinical, and basic science departments at the uh, medical center in the university. And for a number of years, uh, the Institute, which is now 62 years old, has been uh, very active in programs, nutrition programs in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we've done quite a bit in connecting what I would call traditional silos, traditional silos of silo for agriculture, silo for nutrition, silo for uh, uh, agriculture, uh, for, uh, we call it, well, there were three of them. And uh, <laughs> so, what are, what are the goals for today's forum? So I have some audiovisuals now. So I want you to look at me. OK, I'm the audiovisual. Uh, so let's take a horizontal line. We have a horizontal line up here. On one side, we have agriculture. And on one side, we've got uh, nutrition. Now let's take another horizontal line, a little lower climate change, and agriculture. Notice these are parallel lines which often never met. So what's our job today? We have to construct a triangle. Uh, a triangle where at the apex we have climate, and at the two bases, the apices of the bay, we have uh, agriculture, food systems, and on one, the other side, we've got uh, nutrition. And in the center of the triangle, we've got our goals. Improving human nutritional status, improving uh, human productivity, and improving and optimizing human well-being. So that's what we have to do here to today, and we're going to be having workshop over the next couple of days for that. Now, it's a real pleasure, privilege, to be able to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, and then we'll have a panel relating to it uh, on climate, food systems, and nutrition. Uh, Dr. Shauna Downs and I share Canadian heritage, but she comes from the West, and I come from La Belle Provence de Quebec, and more towards the East. But. Uh, Sean obtained her master's degree in nutrition at the University of Alberta, her PhD at the University of Sydney, and then did a postdoc at the Earth Institute and the Institute of Human Nutrition, and then Johns Hopkins. And she's now on faculty at the Department of Health Systems and Policy at the Rutgers School of Public Health. So I first met Shauna uh, at the University of Sydney about six and a half years ago where she not only helped coordinate my visit, but really talked to me about her PhD work. And her PhD work was incredibly intersectoral, interdisciplinary. It was on the high fatty acid intakes, trans fatty acid intakes in India, and the barriers to lower that. And the barriers weren't just policy, but they were economists, they were the industrialists, they were behavior in the population. Uh, many, many sectors that she tied together. And uh, she did it. <laughs> Shauna is remarkable in that she already has over 60 publications. She has a number of awards and honors. I'm not going to list them all. She's got research grants. So I'd like to welcome Shauna today as she helps us bring together three sectors, climate, food systems, and nutrition. Welcome, Shauna. Can everyone hear me okay with this mic? In the back, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so there's gonna be, a, the FEMA is doing an emergency alert I think around 2.18 or something like that. So if everyone puts their phones on airplane mode, then not everyone's phones aren't going to be going off at the same time, um, if you don't mind doing that. All right. 
So thank you, Richard, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's kind of embarrassing to hear about your publication record, but um, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about climate, food systems, and nutrition, and hopefully bringing together that triangle that Richard just talked about of agriculture, climate, and nutrition. And I would argue that food systems kind of is the circle around that triangle, and it encompasses all of that. I use the word food system all the time. I throw it around, and I don't think it's always clear what I'm talking about when I say food system, and I think I'm not the only one who does that. So I thought I'd start off by just going over what I mean by the food system. This is a figure from the high-level panel of experts report that was chaired by Jessica Fonzo, who used to be at Columbia University. And it's looking at what the food system is and looking at the food system in the context of nutrition. So you have on the top here the drivers of the food system. Those are things like climate, obviously, which is going to be the focus of this talk, but also things like urbanization, globalization and trade, the political and economic environment. All of those components drive the food system. Then you have the food supply chain. The food supply chain includes inputs into agricultural production, so things like seeds, water, soil, and then production, how, how the, the crops are harvested, how they're stored, how they're processed, distributed, and traded. And this feeds into the food environment. And the food environment here is basically the environment in which consumers interface with to make decisions about which foods to acquire, purchase, and consume the foods that are available, affordable, and acceptable, and then the quality of those foods. And we as consumers have these personal filters that influence the way we interact with the food environment. It's essentially our baggage. So it's things like our income, our purchasing power, our values, preferences, potentially our disease state. All of those components influence what we, how we decide to purchase uh, specific foods within our food environment. So all of those aspects of the food environment influence the diets that we consume. And those diets obviously influence our nutrition and health outcomes, but also economic environment and socioeconomic outcomes as well. So hopefully that gives you a good sense of just a broad overview of the food environment. This figure here is a figure that is from Dr. Thompson and Mason's book that's going to be discussed on the second panel. It's an overview of the, the causes of malnutrition as identified through the UNICEF framework. We have the basic, underlying, and immediate causes of malnutrition. The basic causes on the top are things like socio-cultural, economic, political context, um, things like inadequate financial, human, social, and physical capital and then resources, land, education, and all sorts of other things. These basic causes then feed into the uh, underlying causes of malnutrition. And there's three main underlying causes of malnutrition. Those are inadequate care and, and, practice, and feeding practices. And this is very important for infants and young children. So how they're fed is really important in terms of nutrition outcomes, as well as mortality. Household food insecurity, this influences dietary intakes. So if you have inadequate dietary intake, you're going to have higher levels of malnutrition. And then thirdly, unhealthy household environments and inadequate health services. So household environment encompasses things like water, sanitation, and hygiene. If you don't have access to clean water, you're more likely to get a disease. If you have disease, you're less likely to be able to absorb the nutrients you consume within your diet. So that increases your risk of malnutrition. And there's both short and long-term consequences of malnutrition. The problem is the food system is really not delivering for nutrition, no matter how we look at it. So I'm going to go over some of the statistics globally. This is from this, the State of Food Insecurity report that just came out a couple weeks ago. Currently, there's 151 million children under five who are stunted. And that's important not just because they're short for their age. It's important because it's an indicator of chronic undernutrition. These children have lower educational attainment. There's lost productivity associated with stunting. And there's also cognitive impairment. When we look at, at acute malnutrition, there's 50 million children in the world under five who are acutely malnourished. And when you look at 
um, micronutrients, five, about 500 million women of reproductive age are anemic. If we broaden that to look at micronutrients more generally, about 2, 2 billion people worldwide are deficient in one micronutrient or more. So alongside these, this pretty high burden of undernutrition, we're also seeing really rapidly growing rates of overweight and obesity. So 38 million children under five are currently overweight. And we, when we look at adults, 672 million adults are obese, so have a BMI over 30. When you throw overweight into the mix, about 2 billion adults worldwide are either overweight or obese. And when we look at global nutrition targets, so both um, SDGs, but also the World Health Organization nutrition targets, the world is off track to meet all of them. So it's a pretty dire situation in terms of food. So when we think of the SDGs, we think of SDG2 as being the SDG that, is, that influences nutrition. Um, but when you think of the food system, and then when you also think of the multiple causes of malnutrition that are displayed in that UNICEF framework that I showed, pretty much all of the SDGs can affect nutrition in some way, mostly through indirect pathways, but they still can affect nutrition and help support nutrition. For example, SDG 6, which is about access to safe water and sanitation. If you have access to safe water and sanitation, you're less likely to be malnourished. Another thing I wanted to point out is that it's really important when we're thinking about nutrition to think about women and young children. The first 1,000 days from, a, from the time a child is conceived up until the time that they are two years, of, two years of age is a really critical window for nutrition. So it really, if, people, if children have proper nutrition during that time, they can grow on to have healthy growth and development. But if not, they, their growth really falters. So it's a really important part. Um, time period from a nutrition perspective. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk more about climate and the food system and its links with nutrition. When we think of the food system, it's really sensitive to climate. It's both a victim and an instigator of climate variability. And I'm going to talk about both those aspects and give you a little bit more context in terms of what I mean. So if we bring it back to the food system diagram, Climate on the top here is a huge driver of the food system as a whole. So climate variability, including extreme events, is influencing the food system. But when we think about our diets and what we're consuming, that is also influencing the, um, the environment through greenhouse gas emissions, water footprints, and loss of biodiversity, among other things. So when we think about climate, food systems, and nutrition, we have to think about climate adaptation, but also about climate mitigation. And I'm going to talk about both sides of that coin throughout this talk. So we need, the diets that we eat have a really negative impact on the environment. I alluded to that in the previous slide, but just to give you some numbers, approximately 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions are related to food, more than 70% of fresh water use, and it's the largest cause of species biodiversity loss. Um, you, if you look at the graph that's on the right, this is looking at food-related greenhouse gas emissions, and it's looking at the different food groups that contribute to those greenhouse gas emissions, both in 2005, 2007, and 2050. And what you can hopefully see is that this red area is red meat. So meat is really the major food group that's contributing to greenhouse gas emissions in our diet. I think if, if meat were its own country, it would be something like the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. This is looking at um, diets more broadly, and again, greenhouse gas emissions. So on the top here, you have, um, you have greenhouse gas emissions per uh, calorie, and then here, this is per serving, and here, per gram of protein. And what you can see is in all ways that you look at greenhouse gas emissions, Fish and livestock are the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously fish, it's quite dependent on how it's, how it's um, produced or caught. Um, but when you look at the diets overall, a vegetarian diet has a much lower uh, carbon footprint than an omnivorous diet. The problem is that diets are shifting quite dramatically. So this is looking at uh, caloric intake and the projected increases in caloric intake over time. And what you can see is that countries around the world, 
regions around the world are increasing their caloric intake. So that means that there will be even more greenhouse gas emissions attributed to food consumption. And when we look at meat consumption in particular, uh, meat consumption is going up quite dramatically. So this is looking at, we have from 1960 to 2010, and this is meat consumed in tons. And you can see China here, there's a huge increase in meat consumption. And it's not just China, other countries as well are having huge increases in meat consumption. So from a climate mitigation perspective, our diets are, are failing the food system. And we definitely need to shift our dietary patterns and reduce meat consumption in particular. All right, so that is how what we're eating is affecting climate. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how climate might be influencing our diets. And I'm gonna preface this by saying that these, the next few slides are studies that are based on modeling. And these, there's a lot of uncertainty in these modeling studies. Um, so I just want, to, want you to keep that in mind and maybe this is something we can talk about more on the panel. So this first study comes from Marco Springman. Um, it was published in The Lancet a couple years ago and it's looking at climate related deaths in 2050 related to climate, uh, or related to dietary risk factors. So basically what they did is they, they used these models to predict how food production would change and then how that food, those changes in food production would affect certain risk factors for diet. Underweight, which is in gray, in blue, fruits and vegetable consumption, in red, red meat consumption, and then overweight and obesity in yellow and blue. And basically, if it's over this black line, that means that there is additional deaths related to these dietary risk factors. If it's below, it's kind of positive, so life saved because of these um, reductions in these diet. It's basically less overweight and obesity. Um, when you look at the global um, picture, the majority of, of deaths related to climate um, and dietary risk factors, it was fruits and vegetables, so reductions in fruits and vegetable consumption. That was driving it. But this is, you know, kind of it's hard to, to imagine that in low middle income countries in Africa, they're going to see this as a positive because you can see underweight is actually driving this instead. So um, although there might be less fruits and vegetables, we have to think about the broader picture. These next two slides are looking at um, how the nutrient quality of foods might change with increased CO2 in the atmosphere. Both, both of these next two slides are from Sam Meyer's work out of Harvard, and it's looking at, with increased atmospheric CO2, how does zinc, iron, and protein levels in specific uh, crops change? And so you can see with the, oops, my pointer went rogue. Okay, so you can see that for these C3 grasses, so wheat, rice, and some of the legumes, there's a reduction in zinc and iron um, with increases in CO2. Uh, this is problematic because some countries' populations consume a lot of their iron and zinc through these legumes and grains or staples. This is building off of this work. This is something that Sam Myers just recently published. And it was looking at increased risk of inadequate nutrient intake from elevated atmospheric CO2. So on the top here, you have the combined risk of iron, zinc, and protein. And then you have iron, protein, zinc. And you can see that there are reductions um, in, in the nutrients. And they tend to be all in the same areas. So we see for combined risk, for iron, for protein, and for zinc, where you're going to see the biggest changes and the, the biggest increase in terms of deficiency is Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And those are the, the regions that already have the highest burden of malnutrition. But what we need to think about, again, is thinking about this in the broader context of diets and dietary changes. And this might be something that we bring up in the panel, too. All right, so it looks like for modeling studies that um, climate change is going to affect diets, but climate is affecting the food system and nutrition now. Although there's not a ton of evidence, we can see how it might be affecting um, nutrition through looking at seasonality, just as one example. So if you think of a farmer, say, in Senegal, 
who has one rainy season. So they plant their crops in maybe July and, and they harvest them maybe around October. And then those crops have to last them for the rest of the year. So if they don't have good storage, they didn't get good yields, by the time they go to, to plant their crops the following July, their food supplies are gonna be dwindling. And this is when there's the hunger season. And the hunger season um, coincides also with the rains because that's why they're producing again, because the rains have come. Um, but it also co coincides with increases in malaria and also severe acute malnutrition. And there's various reasons for this. Obviously, the food stocks are dwindling, as I mentioned. There's also high food prices in markets. The prices of nutritious foods are even higher. Um, and then obviously with increased disease, you also have higher burdens of malnutrition. So this gives you a sense of how climate today can be affecting nutrition outcomes. Now I'm gonna go over some of the ways in which kind of bringing this all together, now how climate variability, including extreme events, can affect the food system as a whole. And there's so many different ways that it can affect the food system and affect nutrition outcomes. So I'm not going to go over all of them, but I'm just going to highlight a few of them. So if we think of these drivers along, so switching from all the drivers of the food system to just thinking of drivers of climate variability, we can see that there are huge impacts on the food supply chain. So obviously, if you have drought or, say, um, flooding or heat stress, this can affect the quantity of crop that's produced, the productivity of the crop. But there can also be uh, effects in terms of the quality of crops. So for example, there's some evidence to suggest that as um, sea temperatures increase, the quality of the fatty acids in some fish species are actually declining. So some of the fish that are polyunsaturated fatty that contain polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are really healthy from a heart perspective, that, that heart healthy fat is actually declining in those fish species. That's just to give you one example. Also, if we think of pests with higher temperatures and drier conditions, aflatoxin, which is a fungal infestation that's essentially like a mold, that increases in crops, particularly maize and groundnut. And then if we think of storage, because that crop needs to be stored afterwards, and um, if there's higher temperatures again or increased humidity, that can increase aflatoxin in that crop even further. When we think about the food environment, obviously climate variability, including shocks, can affect market access. Even if you just think of Hurricane Florence and how that can um, increase barriers to market access in the Carolinas. Imagine what that's like in a developing world context. Or even just in the rainy season, in many countries, um, you'll see uh, roads that are washed out and people aren't able to access the markets anymore. There's also increased food safety risks, and this can happen from a variety of reasons. Obviously, aflatoxin increases the food safety risk, but there's also contamination through water supplies, um, increased um, sewage and runoff that's entering the food supply, and that can increase food safety risk. In terms of personal filters, one of the main ones, obviously, is reduced income. So if farmers are getting lower yields or lower quality crops, then that's likely going to influence the income that they have, and that reduces their, their purchasing power. So instead of being able to purchase a more diverse diet, they're going to be probably spending most of their food dollars on staple foods, which provide really important calories, but not necessarily the nutrients they need. So that can have uh, negative nutrition implications. And then if we think of um, waterborne and vectorborne disease, we see many, many climate drivers that affect both uh, waterborne disease and infections and also vectorborne, such as malaria. And all of these lead to increased stunting, underweight, wasting, low birth weight, and micronutrient deficiencies from a nutrition perspective. If we think even broader, these feed back into the top drivers of the food system by affecting loss of assets and livelihoods, displacement, migration, and in some contexts, um, conflict. 
And again, I brought it up earlier, women and children tend to be the most, most vulnerable to these climate um, shocks and how they affect nutrition outcomes. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So given that there are so many different areas in which climate is affecting the food system and, and then that subsequently affecting nutrition outcomes, we really need multiple solutions. And I think one way to think about it is to, to link climate adaptation and nutrition-sensitive agriculture. So nutrition-sensitive agriculture is essentially the injection of nutrition in agricultural programming and interventions. So if we combine climate adaptation and also nutrition-sensitive agriculture, we can create something like nutrition-sensitive climate, climate adaptation. I don't know, I just coined that. I liked it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> And there's four areas that I think that um, nutrition can be an entry point for this nutrition-sensitive climate adaptation. So one is through increased production of nutrient-rich foods. The other is reduced food safety risk and food loss, because a lot of our food is also being lost. Um, the other is increasing the availability, affordability, and acceptability of nutrient-rich foods. And then lastly, improving health, water, sanitation environments to reduce disease risk. And then whilst thinking of these four different areas to inject nutrition, we have to also think about these cross-cutting considerations. One is women's empowerment. We know if we empower women, nutrition outcomes um, improve. The other is investment in, in infrastructure. A lot of the interventions that we might use to, to support um, nutrition-sensitive climate adaptation need better infrastructure. And thirdly, we need strength and capacity, both in terms of um, agricultural extension workers, but also community health workers. So I'm not going to go over all these entry points, but there's a lot of different levers we can use to try and support nutrition-sensitive climate adaptation. And I'm just going to mention a few because I know I'm running out of time. But one might be in terms of the input supply, improving using biofortified seeds so there's more nutrient dense. From a production standpoint, producing win-win-win crops, and what I mean by that are crops that are nutrient-rich, that are um, resilient to different climate risks, for, for example, drought-resistant, and then thirdly and importantly, that they're still productive. Um, and there are crops out there that do exist that have all those three components. Improving post-harvest practices to reduce aflatoxin is one way to address this. <laughs> Increasing primary processing. So not all food processing is bad. That's a misconception. And if we use things like fermentation and drying of nutrient-rich foods, that will enable people to access those foods for a longer period of time because they're perishable. Um, improving road and market infrastructure is obviously really important. Creating social safety nets to increase the affordability of nutritious foods. And then lastly, investing in things like bed nets, insecticides to reduce disease risk, and also water treatment. So these are just some of the ways in which we can inject nutrition into climate adaptation. And I think what is really exciting about ACT Today and the work at the IRI is they have a tool to help facilitate this. And I think using climate services, we could really support nutrition-sensitive climate adaptation. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of how they might be used because I am not the expert in climate services, but I'll just briefly go over the three main areas that I think that climate services can support nutrition-sensitive climate adaptation. The first is risk assessment for better targeting interventions. So that might be something like spatial targeting of food safety and lost hotspots. Early warnings. So early warnings of climate shocks to inform, for example, the varieties planted or bred, so a drought-resistant crop, for example. And then in terms of long-term planning and preparedness, things like the development of relocation plans for populations that might be displaced due to climate shocks or, uh, or to longer-term trends in climate. And then development of plans to support livelihood diversification. And these are just a few areas. And it's really, this is sort of what we're going to build on in this workshop over the next couple of days. So just as some final thoughts. Um, we do need to act today, and I, and I really mean that. Um, a lot of the nutrition field is really focused on how nutrition is going to be affected in 2050, how climate is going to affect nutrition in 2050. But really, it's affecting nutrition now. We just might not have all the data we want to support that. Climate affects the food system and nutrition through multiple direct and indirect pathways. 
And that's why there's not going to be one magic bullet solution to try and address this. We're going to need a lot of different leverage points. We also need a combination of climate mitigation and adaptation. And shifting dietary patterns needs to be a part of this. So diets do need to change worldwide. And lastly, climate services have a role to play to prioritize actions. And that's what's really exciting about the Act Today project. So I think I will finish off there in the interest of time. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Wow, Shauna, you did it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, terrific overview. And uh, we're now going to, we're not, we're going to save questions for during the panel. And uh, so I'll invite Ruth DeVries, who's the co-moderator of this panel, up to the front and also ask the panel members to come up here to uh, the front of the room. We have hope enough chairs, uh, Hannah Nissan, Jillian Wade, Marugi and Durango, and Glenn Denning. And uh, just, just before I turn it over to Ruth to uh, get into the uh, more substantive introduction, I just want to say uh, I promised you a short bio. So uh, I come from uh, Canada. I trained in medicine. And then I joined something called the Zambia Flying Doctor Service. And what did I learn in the Zambia Flying Doctor Service? I was given a crib sheet. I was given seeds. And it was my responsibility to improve agriculture in the area because everyone comes to the clinic. So we started the clinics days and half days by talks on agriculture and ecology. And I, as an MD who never thought about food systems, had a crib sheet. And it worked. So I you know, continued my health training and then went into basic science research as well in molecular biology of mechanisms of cardiovascular disease, which I still do. I have a couple of labs in the black building here. Uh, but how does this relate to climate change? Uh, we've actually formed a consortium in East Africa called the African Nutritional Research Science Consortium. It's facilitated by the Institute, where we're going to be training PhDs in basic laboratory sciences over there locally in human biology and agricultural sciences. And as a result of this, these meetings here that we've been having on climate change in the past year, climate is now being introduced into our curricula. And how might climate affect basic science training? Well, you know what comes along with seasonal hunger? Famine. Women who were pregnant during a famine. They have babies that have severe epigenetic changes that lead to increased risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, certain infectious diseases, and certain cancers when they become adults. So we're all linked. And I'm really grateful that uh, I've had the opportunity to start interacting with climate people because I think it's the way it's going to change so many of our ways, the way we do things. Uh, it's already changed some of the things we're planning in Africa. And with that, we'll ask Ruth DeVries to come up and say hello. Good afternoon. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Shona, for that great overview. I'm on the faculty at the Morningside campus in Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. I come to this topic of nutrition and climate in a very roundabout way. I started working on forests and deforestation, and that got me into agriculture because that's the driver of deforestation, and agriculture got me into nutrition uh, because what's the point of agriculture but to feed people? with nutritious food. <laughs> and I can say it is a delight to work with so many of you here where we are just pounding down the, the silos and getting at what matters, which is nutrition and 
healthy people and be able to think about that from so many important perspectives that bring us out of our disciplines and out of our comfort zones, but we're all after the same end. So ACT Today is a fantastic example of breaking down the, the silos, and I look forward to, to uh, doing that in the next couple of days and beyond. So what we're going to do with this panel is ask each of the uh, panel members to introduce themselves very briefly and reflect on Shana's uh, presentation very briefly. And then we'll do another round where each panelist has an opportunity to elaborate from their own perspective. And then we promise, Richard and I promise, that we will have plenty of time for your questions and your ideas. So I'm going to take the first prerogative of reflecting on Shana's presentation and ask that uh, there are, not necessarily that we need an answer right now, but to, to throw it out, that there are so many entry points, so many leverage points, so many possible interventions. You mentioned uh, many of them, whether it's sanitation or more nutritious uh, foods or access. There's so many different uh, uh, possible entry points. How do we think about prioritizing in different places and understanding what are the true leverage points that would, uh, that would make a difference? So that's my... A uh, question that comes out of your very nice overview. So I'm going to sit down and ask the panelists to uh, to go through and introduce themselves and have a reflection on Shana's talk. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Murugi Dirango, and um, thank you, Shona, for your presentation. I'm sorry I came in halfway, um, but I think uh, you raise, you know, uh, questions that really have to be um, looked into uh, much deeper, especially coming from uh, where I am located. Uh, as I said, my name is Murugi Dirango. I am currently the director of the Columbia Global Centers, Nairobi. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Columbia Global Centers. Uh, they are part of Columbia University, and we have a network of nine centers uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, we have Nairobi, Tunis, we have Rio, Santiago, um, we have Paris, uh, Beijing, um, Istanbul, and uh, Amman, Jordan. I don't know if I'm missing one. Um, so basically what we do, we are located in different regions of the world where there are issues of, you know, uh, significant global uh, importance. And what we do, we link Columbia University with our local regions. And uh, we are therefore, we can facilitate uh, research, uh, education, as well as public programs. Uh, so we work with local partners on the ground. So having said that, um, I would say... Uh, being located in Nairobi in the East African region, uh, the climate change uh, talk, debate, is something that is of really great significance here because um, the impact in that region will be much greater maybe than in other parts. In, in Africa will be much higher than maybe in uh, other parts such as uh, where we are currently. Um, so it's important to, to engage in this discussion and really think about how to address some of the, the what we do about it, some of the solutions to, to the issues that we are facing that we're going to be talking about today. So thank you. Hi, good afternoon. So my name is Jillian Wade and I'm um, with Helen Keller International in the Bangladesh country office. Um, during my time in Bangladesh, uh, my work has really focused on the development and management of nutrition and food security surveillance systems and on leveraging existing data to support policy and program development and modification. Um, my current role is as a technical advisor to the National Information Platform for Nutrition in Bangladesh. And this program, which is funded by the European Union and the UK Department for International Development um, and supported in addition by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, it's being undertaken in 10 countries in Africa, South America, and Asia, and it wants to leverage existing data in each country to support policy and program development through capacity building activities within the government. Uh, 
Shauna's presentation has really pointed out a lot of the ways I had the privilege of actually seeing the slides before. However, it was only during the presentations that it was very easy to see a lot of the links between what um, climate action could actually do and also some of the strengths of nutrition surveillance, and that's what I hope to touch on in my remarks. You. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Hannah Nissan. I'm a climate scientist at, uh, at the IRI. Um, I uh, came to the IRI actually to work on long-term climate change issues. And um, through my efforts to do that, I've sort of increasingly focused much more on issues of climate variability. Um, as you know, and I think this is a great example of, of the type of uh, subject where climate change is a major issue. But when we start to look at what we can really do, um, it's a lot to do with more short-term actions. So that's my, that's my background. I've been working a lot at the intersection of climate and health um, on various different topics like uh, heat waves and malaria and soon-to-be nutrition. Um, Sean, I thought that was a really fantastic um, framing of the issues that we're going to talk about the next couple of days. Um, I particularly enjoyed um, and I uh, agree very much with your framing at the end of, of where the entry points are for climate services. Um, and that sort of division of the opportunities into um, the opportunities we have to improve nutrition outcomes through understanding the base risk of climate or nutrition. So that's really about analyzing um, historical data, climate data, how, how it relates to nutrition outcomes, um, and potentially um, through those relationships, understanding, um, passing out the influence that climate may have had on the success or failure of, of previous interventions. And then the second piece, which was the early warning component, and that's the additional opportunity that we might be able to garner to, to um, use that knowledge from the, the, the observational analyses to predict and to provide early warnings for certain types of actions which maybe require more notice than we can get um, just by waiting for them to happen. Um, so uh, I thought that was a really great way of framing it, and I think we should um, continue to think about it that way. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenn Denning. Uh, I'm Professor of Practice at SEPA, the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the Earth Institute, where I chair the uh, Faculty Practice Committee. And I'm founding director of the MPA in Development Practice, um, which is now in its 10th year with over 350 graduates and uh, bringing 50 new graduates uh, into this area of sustainable development uh, practice every year. So you've heard practice, practice, practice. So that describes you know, reasonably well um, what I focus on. Um, the MPADP, um, it, it imparts knowledge and practical skills to solve complex problems that require uh, multidisciplinary and cross-sectoral approaches, precisely what Richard was talking about in terms of breaking down um, silos. And one of the most complex problems out there, and one of the reasons why uh, I really engage my students in this area of nutrition and food systems, is the whole area of malnutrition and trying to understand, um, you know, the nature of malnutrition and 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 some of the solutions. Sort of almost equally challenging is climate and climate variability and climate change. So we bring these two sort of terribly wicked sort of problems together, and that makes things even, even more complicated. So um, through the ACT Today project, uh, 14 of our students have spent the summer, three months out in the field, seven di different countries doing the initial sort of groundwork to collect information and, and, and help us piece together um, you know, what is going on in terms of um, uh, adaptation, but also what is, what is going on in terms of um, understanding variability and how climate services could respond. Um, before I came to Colombia, I worked in Asia and Africa uh, for more than 30 years, primarily with three organizations, the International Rice Research Institute, the World Agroforestry Center, and the Earth Institute, progressively getting more ecological as, as my uh, career went, went on. Um, I am an agronomist, so not a nutritionist, and that, that's sort of painfully obvious as I speak more. Um, but I have benefited you know, tremendously from working with people like Richard and uh, Jessica Fanzo and, and Shauna. Um, you know, so I, I thoroughly recommend, if you're not a nutritionist, to work with nutritionists. Um, they, they, they really don't bite. And, and I find that they're, 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 they're very collaborative, particularly when you take them um, to the field, out of the laboratories. 
Um, so that was the easy bit, was talking about myself, and I'm sort of playing for time a little bit. And one of the reasons is because um, as much as I tried, I really struggled to come up with anything particularly, you know, uh, stunning or, or critical in a positive way uh, about the, the paper, which the detailed white paper, which I've read, as well as the, of course, the slide presentation we just heard. Um, you know, I, I think you've done a, you know, really a, a fantastic job, uh, Shauna, in, in pulling that together because as, as Richard, I think, pointed out, we, we commonly, um, you know, make that link between climate and agricultural climate and food systems and, and also between food systems and nutrition, but to really pull it all together in a more holistic, interactive way, whether it's a triangle or a circle or, or something. It probably is more of a circle than a triangle, but somebody said a triangle within a circle. Uh, you know, but the idea that, that you can have um, you know, vicious, vicious circles or vicious cycles or virtuous circles and cycles, and I think that's, that's what we see um, with this. We see climate clearly affecting food system performance. In fact, to be honest, it always has, right? I mean, the food systems we have today are very much a product of, of, of climate and that the performance affects nutritional outcomes. So I think um, as, we, as we sort of reflect on the role of climate services, I think um, the table in your paper, and I think you sort of summarised at table three, which I think really I refer you all to this, the, really shows very concrete ideas about how those interventions can take place. I think the big challenge will be is not, you know, is not just identifying how and where, but who. And I think how we really make, um, we turn, we make climate services more operational in terms of influencing uh, decision making is, is a key. And I'll come back to that later um, um, in the second part. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I actually think we're dealing more with a, a, a three-dimensional morphing blob <laughs> than a triangle or a circle, and just this complexity of wicked problem upon wicked problem. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is ask each panelist to expand from their own perspectives, and we have a, such a wonderful array of perspectives from working in the field on interventions to uh, to national level, to uh, coming from the university side. So we have some very nice complementary perspectives here. So we're going to try to go back to the, actually the order that's listed there. And uh, if we'll start with Hannah. So if you could elaborate a bit, and then we will go through and then open it up for discussion. Sure. Hi. Um, yeah, so I think, um, I think it's a valid question to ask at the beginning of this why we're really focusing on climate, because clearly, you know, Sean has laid out multiple different, there are myriad different things that affect um, nutrition. Climate is only one of them. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's also, we, we haven't really got the data yet, but it's highly possible that it's not one that counts for a, an enormous portion of the variance. So why are we focusing on climate? Where's the opportunity? Um, and there's a few qualities about the climate that I think um, make it a very distinct opportunity. The first is that it is routinely measured in space and in time. You're going to hear more from Gillian about um, a lot of the measurement challenges for, for nutrition data, but climate comparatively is, is um, we have a wealth of data, um, albeit with some issues. Um, the second is that the climate has a, has a certain structure to it, which affords us um, a lot when it comes to the analysis. There are regular patterns of climate variability, and in both space and in time. And that allows us to look back over the historical record and try to understand some of the relationships between climate and nutrition, and then we can use those relationships to take action. Um, and the third is that, well, we've got, we've got climate variability in terms of regular patterns, um, the seasons, the days, the years, and geographic, uh, geographical variations, but there's also variations around what we would normally expect. So in some years, the monsoon is wetter than in other years. It may start a little bit later. There may be a few more breaks in the middle of it. And in comparison with the, the socioeconomic data, the, type of, the other types of drivers that influence nutrition, these variations are relatively predictable. They're not predictable in every situation and every single time, 
but compared to a lot of the other drivers of nutrition outcomes, there is some predictability there, and that's something that we can harness. So I think all of those present a real opportunity. Um, and, you know, we can, we can do all of the work to try and understand what the historical variability of the climate is and, and to try and improve the models to predict it. But how do we ensure that that actually translates into an outcome that, you know, that we can measure in, in, in terms of nutrition? Um, and I think there's some, there's some key next steps for us in this, in this area. So Sean has outlined some lots of different possible pathways um, that climate can influence nutrition. At the moment, most of those are... Uh, I think, fairly conceptual, right? So there's very little quantitative evidence behind those. And the, the first step for us is to try and put a bit of quantitative evidence behind some of those steps so that we can actually understand the mechanisms through which climate influences nutrition. <clears throat> That's the first thing. For example, um, in Bangladesh, there is, uh, there is a relationship between the price of um, staple foods, um, namely rice, and malnutrition um, with some, some lag down, down the line. And I understand that that's quite a common relationship in other countries also. Um, so that relationship is there. It requires some investigation, but, it, but it's there. And there's a suggestion that flooding in Bangladesh around September time is associated with um, price, price spikes and fluctuations. So that's another relationship that we really need to explore. Is that really the case? Can we rely on that relationship? Um, and so we need to sort of pass out those different connections. But in order, for, in order for that research to actually lead to something concrete, there's an additional, crucial additional step that we have to build in there. And that's to ask the question that, let's say the relationship between flooding and price, prices is, does show to be robust. What is the menu of actions that we have to do about that? What can policymakers in Bangladesh do if they know that it's going to flood to either um, a, um, compensate for uh, fluctuating prices or try and implement something to reduce the impact on, on malnutrition down the line. And it's understanding what that menu of actions is that will help us to develop the climate services to support them. Do they, can they, for example, wait to see whether flooding happens or do they need some advance notice? If they need advance notice, how much? And for us to be able to answer those questions with a climate service, we then have to really understand what the drivers of flooding are in Bangladesh. And that's really something that we don't understand very much at the moment. You know, there are parts of the world where we have strong predictability for seasonal climate because of the El Nino Southern Oscillation or other things. But in Bangladesh, those drivers just aren't really well understood. So there's some really core climate research that has to be done in order for us to develop the forecasts to support those actions. And that's just one example of all the different pathways that we could explore. I think I'll leave it there. Yes. Thank you, Hannah. Unfortunately, my presentation will be a lot more maybe abstract and less practical because I uh, come at a lot of things from more of a data perspective. And uh, the comments I had was that embedding climatic data into nutritional data systems is obviously vital, especially to provide um, advanced warning, but it also has unique constraints because what we think of as nutritional data is often collected in surveys on an ad hoc manner and with limited concern given to seasonal representativeness and consistency. So this is the idea for climatic data. We know what's happening in every season. When I go out with a DHS survey, sometimes it's in the monsoon, sometimes it's in the winter, it's at different times. Another example of this is in response to climatic shocks, often um, NGOs and UN systems will field smart surveys, which they collect mostly food security and child growth data, and they field them to better target relief, like who is the most affected by this event. However, without pre-event data, we actually don't know what the changes were that were caused by the event. We can say what area should we target now, but we don't actually know what the changes were or how the people affected responded to these shocks, so whether this will feed into a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle. So how the responses to the shock could either make a shock in the future more devastating or less devastating, how resilient the people are. Um, in addition, because of the ad hoc timing, the data, it, re it prevents effective integration of climatic data, um, especially due to the long timescales that are needed to provide sufficient variation for an exposure, uh, for the exposure to actually measure a response. So we can't just have one random rainy season and, and try and look at the relationship because you might not have enough variation within space or time. Um, so in that way, nutritional surveillance, such as what we have had in Bangladesh for a relatively long time period, 
um, is rather rare and it can have some unique learning act opportunities. Uh, there are three commonly noted objectives for surveillance, and those kind of exactly mimic, although in a different order, the points for action that was on the slide in Shauna's presentation. So these are long-term aid planning, short-term monitoring and evaluation of programs, and also timely warning. So climatic data and forecasting would obviously strongly support uh, both long-term aid planning and also timely warning. And it also will definitely provide context to program monitoring and evaluation. So one of the things in program monitoring is we want to say, the project succeeded or the project didn't succeed. However, sometimes that can just be due to contextual um, activities. You could build a dam, and if you actually, and if the dam's job was to prevent, uh, to provide irrigation, if you have a low rainfall year, the dam could be successful. If you don't have a low rainfall year, obviously it's not going to be successful. So even our programs and projects really have to be viewed in the lens of the context in which we're evaluating them. Um, so climatic data would also support our ability to understand the tracking of trends over time and learn more about the causes of malnutrition and food insecurity. And an example of this is that a nutrition surveillance data in Bangladesh clearly shows um, seasonality of both stunting and wasting with countercyclical peaks of high wasting in the monsoon months and high stunting in the winter months. However, we don't know what is driving this. Are they countercyclical because the wasting is causing the stunting? Is this something to do with rainfall? Is this something to do with heat? We, we don't really understand what is driving these seasonal changes. We just know that they occur. Um, in addition, there's kind of, a, there's kind of a, a pull between both the representativeness of surveillance systems and their ability to um, use these systems and combine them with climatic data. So uh, in 1990, the first surveillance system in Bangladesh uh, was set up with sentinel sites around the country. And this really enables us to collapse the data into certain locations in the country and then easily pair it with climatic data. A newer system relied more on repeated cross-sectional surveys. The reason why the repeated cross-sectional surveys was preferred in country is because it's representative of the nation as a whole. And that also does inspire action. People are more likely to take action when they know that it's a national problem, it's a national <coughs> issue, whereas the small-scale work that we do provides a good deal of information, but it doesn't necessarily um, motivate action in the same way. So um, suggestions for perhaps the way ahead must be both including more robust analysis techniques, but also expanding what we think of as nutrition data. So not just focusing on child nutrition, undernutrition data like stunting and wasting, but really expanding our menu of options. Um, for example, in the 2015 Global Nutrition Report, um, there was a correlation between the extent of flooding in Bangladesh and rice production, where both too little and too much flooding led to low yields. So it would be interesting we could explore this relationship with a wider variety of crops and see the impact of these climatic events more on the agriculture system as a whole. Um, and trying to link climatic information to data that's available at greater frequency and with greater um, spatial representativeness than nutrition data, meaning anthropometry. Um, and these examples of these data that could be useful are things such as food prices, which were already mentioned, also yields, also health system data. How could we try to extract useful indicators from the health system? So um, these are things that we're, I'm really hoping that the National Information Platforms for Nutrition and also other partners can help lead the way in the future. Uh, thank you. So uh, in my case, I'm going to talk from uh, the East African, and maybe Southern African perspective of what uh, uh, we're observing. Um, and maybe let me just mention uh, something I forgot to state during the introduction. My background is in nutrition, uh, public health nutrition, and I've worked uh, uh, both in, in Kenya, uh, looking at food security, looking at stunting, looking at HIV and nutrition, and I've also worked in the Mississippi Delta in the states of Arkansas, Mississippi, and uh, Louisiana, looking at the other end of the spectrum, um, obesity and, and uh, physical um, activity as it relates to <coughs> nutrition. Um, so, you know, as I was doing some of the background on this, I found um, data from CEDA and FAO um, and this is information that, of course, we all know that the most vulnerable states in Africa in the context of climate, and cha uh, climate change and security include countries such as Burundi, Kenya, Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Chad, Niger, 
Nigeria, Sudan, and the Sahel region. So um, <clears throat> the East African region is one of the places, and the Southern African and the West Africa, the whole continent um, is, is really vulnerable to, to this issue we are discussing. Um, if, if we think about it, in the last few months, we've had flooding uh, in Kenya. We've had flooding in Nigeria. We've had flooding in other places. We've had drought in um, countries, such regions of Ethiopia and so on. Um, so climate change in, in the region is leading to um, change in rainfall patterns. Uh, we are seeing more frequent droughts, more frequent flooding, more frequent storms. Um, they, this is an addition to higher temperatures on the ground, um, causing a lot of uh, evaporation rates and therefore leading to water scarcity. On the other hand, we have sometimes cooling temperatures like um, in the early this year, in the East African region, we had really cold temperatures. Uh, so again, this swing in, in, in temperatures are being experienced. Um, as the ground temperature goes up and water evaporates uh, and water scarcity increases, we are seeing uh, increased water conflict, uh, conflicts around water that are related to water, and it is estimated that there will be new, new, an additional 75 million people who are water scarce by 2020 in the region. Um, so some of these conflicts are already playing out. So for example, pastoralists who have to move with their animals because they can no longer find grazing grounds and are moving across the country. And uh, once the, the animal feed runs out, the, the grazing grounds run out, they will invade farmer's land and actually you know, push their animals into the land. And we've seen fights erupting over this and actually people even being displaced from their homes because of uh, such kinds of conflicts. Now the changing uh, rainfall patterns also will impact, uh, is impacting grain yields um, where you have either um, drought and therefore not enough harvest, or you have rainfall that falls in the middle of the season uh, where crops are not yet dry, maize is rotting in the field, and therefore food security increases. Um, we, we also uh, see it in terms of animal species, some of them dying off, new diseases that are creeping up and uh, wiping off uh, types of uh, some, some species of animals. Um, so we're also seeing an ex, um, expected shift in season for, for production. So farmers are no longer able to predict when they should plant, when they should uh, you know, harvest and this kind of a thing uh, because of the, the change in, in uh, the, the patterns. Um, as you well know, most of the population in Africa is, uh, depends on subsistence farming, uh, which is rain fed, and uh, hence they are very vulnerable to these kinds of uh, changes in, in the environment. Um, now, to preserve and enhance food security, we will require uh, agricultural systems in, to be put in place that, you know, to the degree that they can, assure uh, higher productivity. So maybe improve seeds that are able to be more resilient to, to these kinds of, of uh, changes. Um, there needs to be more efficient use of water, trapping water, uh, managing water, um, enhancing soil nutrients, and as well as uh, protecting genetic resources. Um, there is also a need to think about uh, the groups that may be vulnerable to these issues. So when food runs out, when there is drought, it is likely that women and men will maybe change their, their, their kind of productive uh, activity as they go out to look for uh, food to feed their families. Uh, if we have water scarcity, girls will be sent off and not attend school because they have to look for water. Uh, but also boys. Um, in the case of uh, cultures or communities that have animals, it is usually the role of boys to look after those animals. And if they cannot find grazing grounds, then they will have to leave school and drive the animals to the places where they can find animal feed. Um, so this, these are some of the challenges um, that we see, and it will need action at different levels. Uh, so it will be at the community level, uh, working with community members so that they know how to uh, manage these changes, but also support of governments and also international organizations in managing this. So for example, farmers have to be trained in new techniques in farming, uh, what kinds of new seeds should they use, um, 
So all this needs a lot of coordination at every level. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think there's a, there's a broad agreement around this internal logic of, uh, of climate, food systems, nutrition, whether it's a triangle, a circle, or a, maybe a four-dimensional, including time, uh, you know, component to it. Uh, and I think that, that kind of logic Kind of, it works pretty well among among us, among uh, you know universities and uh, even international partners and even donors. But I think um, it might not necessarily be enough to change the way that governments think. And I'm kind of looking over at Wilmot over there, and I want his perspectives on this as well, uh, because you know once we shift the focus to government i think i think we've got to bring into account two, two issues one is the national economy sort of bring the economy into the picture and make the point that climate threatens the national economy uh, and it can do so mediated through the food system uh, the effects that it has on national food security whether there be floods in bangladesh or droughts in in in, in southern africa or wherever they could do so directly by simply uh, meaning a shortage of food, even a shortage of basic cereals, a shortage of energy. We still have undernourishment in the world. It's not simply um, the, the micronutrients that, and protein that we've, we've, we've seen up on the, uh, in the slides. Um, and, and for that reason, I'd really caution us all to not reduce emphasis on food staples like rice, wheat and corn or maize. Um, we really have to consider f the importance of maintaining low food prices and stability of supply to ensure national food security. That's first and foremost in most uh, developing country settings from a political standpoint. Um, nutrition is one thing and it's extremely important and it can certainly, as we've seen in the slides and Shauna's paper, it can affect um, uh, cognitive and ultimately uh, economic, uh, economic outcomes. But food security generally is, we shouldn't lose that from our language. The second one is national peace and security, and I'm really glad Marugi brought that, uh, that, that point up. Um, again, climate threatens and may undermine uh, national and even international uh, peace and security. <coughs> and I, you just have to look at the, the conflicts in Nigeria right now, um, you know, which the, the, the death toll of that, exactly from what you've described, pastoralists moving into cropping areas, the conflicts from that are way higher than anything that Boko Haram and the terrorists in that part of the world have, have achieved in terms of um, mortality. So, you know, an important conclusion that we should make from this, and again, I think from a, a political advocacy perspective, um, is to make the point, and I've been making this for a long time, that a well-nourished nation is a prosperous nation. Um, and, and I've been using this in Malawi and Timor-Leste and, and most recently in Tajikistan, as recently as this morning. Um, and I think we should now add to that point that climate threatens that kind of a vision. So uh, it's not enough that a well-nourished nation is a prosperous nation. I think investing in climate services uh, is an investment in future prosperity. Now, that sounds kind of self-serving for IRI and various others who work in this particular field. We may have to come up with a sexier term than, than, than climate services. Uh, you know, I love the, the way that you've... We're trying to come up with something that links climate and nutrition for adaptation, right? So uh, climate smart agriculture, it drives me crazy the idea that you can bring together adaptation, mitigation, and increased incomes. Now we've got to introduce nutrition into that, and I think we need to come up with a, with a term that could be used. I'll just end with a couple of points in terms of where I think, um, where ACT Today could, could, could make a difference. And I certainly think, number one, um, in terms of climate, understanding climate uh, uh, vulnerability, and also uh, doing readiness assessments. So. The, the kinds of, again, operationalizing these good ideas, and, and Shauna has touched on that in her Appendix 1, um, but operationalizing what would a climate service entity look like? If we treated climate services not as, you know, the Met, surface, uh, the, the Met service in the basement of a 
whatever, the Ministry of Defence or whatever. Uh, but we treat it as absolutely crucial, as literally as crucial as the military uh, in many settings, that, that this is for national security, this is for the national economy. Um, so, so such units need to be, you know, uh, well governed, have sufficient capacity, budget, communication approaches that work. Um, capacity building has to be part of that, and I think again, ACT today could be part of that capacity building through various kinds of, uh, you know, executive train. First of all, awareness of political leaders and parliamentarians and the like, but but also. As, as you are doing now, right, you know, down to the actual effective functioning of, of, of these services. I wanted to just make one additional point, and that relates to resource mobilisation, because ultimately all these things are constrained by funds. Just um, yesterday I had a conversation with the Asian Development Bank. They said 75% of their investments going forward are going to be climate tagged, in the sense that they are identifying the, uh, the relationship with and understanding the way in which uh, climate is taken into account in their future investments. Uh, it's really important, I think, that ACT today and, 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 and all of us working in this area would reach out to finance institutions like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, um, because basically that's where, that's where the money is, all right? Uh, and they're investing in, in agriculture, in, 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 in physical infrastructure, and all of these, from what I can tell, are relatively poorly informed by climate services. So we need to make the point that these should be an integral part of these multi-billion dollar annual investments. Richard, do you have any comments before we open it up? Uh, well, I've been taking good notes, and... Uh, I appreciate, I wanted by this links, uh, what Glenn was saying and uh, Jillian, you no, know, when we look at the data that's available, so you go to the FAO, can you, can you go to the World, uh, you know, World Health uh, Food Program, UNICEF, we have, all, we have tons of data, but you can't mix them, you can't bring them together. And uh, what one of the things, and I think you allude to, you know, where are we starting from and where are we going? And we need to have some kind of assessment, some kind of metrics where we can think about uh, where, where we are together in a unified way in different regions so that we don't cons constantly deal with apples, oranges, and pineapples. Uh, because that's what quite a bit of the work that we have, or the data we have available <coughs> is. So how do we bring this together, not just from the nutrition perspective, but from the agricultural perspective? And I think that's a big challenge. Okay, I'm sure there are many people who have questions or comments. You can direct them to a specific panelist or to everyone. How are we, how are we doing this? Are we having a, oh, the mics. Would line up at the mics. I'm sure, there are some of you out there. Can, can, maybe we can run the mic. To the I have the thing now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Use it. Um, Sean, I just had a question. If you wouldn't mind expounding on the acceptability of nutritious foods. Yeah, so when I was talking about acceptability, I mean it in a couple different contexts. It's, it's essentially, though, that people desire those foods. They want to purchase them. And when you're thinking about climate, it could be something related to, for example, lack of cold storage, and then um, those foods are bruised or they don't look nice, and then people don't want to buy them, and then that creates food waste. So that's just one example. Um, looking at more overweight obesity, there's also a lot of advertising that influences the de desirability of different foods. So that also comes into play when we're thinking about the food environment. Because we don't, we don't choose the foods that we do based on just because we are demanding them. There's also some external factors that are influencing our demand um, through food industry and other mechanisms. So that's what I mean in terms of acceptability. Another example is Actually, if you think of food aid, 
Um, is the food aid, are the foods that are being given to people the foods that they want to consume? Is that part of their regular diet? Or are, are those foods foreign to them? Because that makes people less likely to want to eat them as well. Um, so just as a few, a few examples. Yeah, my name is um, Inge Brouwer. I'm a nutritionist um, from Wageningen University and leader of the research program Food Systems for Healthier Diets. Um, when you talk about nutrition, um, I'm getting a bit confused uh, what you're actually talking about. Because if I listen carefully to you and what you said now, you actually talk about diets or diet quality. So if that is the case, why did you remove diet from the HLPE mm. framework? Mm -hmm. Then if it's not diets, but you talk about nutrition status, um, I, have to, I think we should be a bit careful because when we talked about nutrition sensitive agriculture in the beginning, I have to admit that we also promised too much. And now, actually, we are concluding that we cannot change stunting with nutrition-sensitive agriculture. And I think this, the same will be with uh, nutrition-sensitive climate um, uh, adaptation or mitigation. Um, it's such a complex problem. Um, we will not be able to change stunting on its own by a nutrition-sensitive climate. So I think we should be very clear what you're talking about when you talk about nutrition. Um, and I think it should be diets or diet quality. And not only micronutrient deficiencies, but also looking at the NCDs. And that also has an effect on the target population you are looking at. Because then it's not only women and children, but it's also adolescents and it's men and it's adult population. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, that's a really good point. So I, yeah, when I'm talking about, when I say nutrition, I mean diet and nutrition. But in terms of the HLP report, um, that was just to try and take that figure that's very complex and make it a little bit less complex. Um, it was actually um, one of, um, just, just Fonzo was trying to make it a little bit easier, a little bit more palatable, let's just say, because it's a very complex diagram, although probably one of the better ones in terms of the food system. But diet is the main component. When I'm talking about nutrition, I'm really talking about it in terms of disease and how that can affect absorption of, of nutrients. But overall, my work particularly, it's always about diet quality and looking at the big picture in terms of diets. Um, I'm a nutritionist, but I'm not a dietitian. I really focus on diets. And I think when we're thinking about making the links between climate, um, agricultural production, it's diets. But when you bring the sanitation piece into it, then it becomes also nutrition. I know it's maybe, um, for some people, it's semantics, but I know that there is this distinction, um, and it's probably clumsy of me to, to constantly refer to nutrition when it's really a lot of times focusing on diets. In terms of looking at nutrition-sensitive agriculture and, and the effects on stunting, I think one of the challenges with us using stunting as an indicator is that it takes a long time to change. So some of those projects um, that have looked at the impact of nutrition-sensitive interventions and use stunting as a primary indicator haven't been as long as maybe they needed to be to make larger changes in, ter in terms of stunting. Um. And could I add that nutrition-sensitive agriculture doesn't change anything on its own. Mm -hmm. It has to be combined, and that's what makes it so complicated. If you're not combining that with you know, water and sanitation and right. behavioral change around cooking and, and, yeah. and consumption, it's not going to have an impact. Exactly. Correct? And that's the thing, like, that's why I say it's not going to be just one thing. There's all these different leverage points, and I know that then becomes much more complicated, but it's needed because nutrition is complicated. So the solutions are going to be complicated as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm head of an institute of human nutrition. And uh, so I'm not quite sure always what nutrition is. So I just looked it up here on Google. <laughs> nutrition, the process of providing or obtaining the food necessary for health and growth. And I think we've seen a lot of that. And it's the branch of science that deals with nutrients and nutrition, particularly in humans. But I would agree, fish and livestock and soil as well. Uh, so the way I think we have to think about nutrition, it's not a solo silo discipline. It's a partner. 
and uh, it crosses so many of the sectors that we've seen today and with, uh, I guess, entry points and uh, that we have to really define and how to better utilize uh, what's written here in Google. Hi, right here. <laughs> um, my name is Regine Fansaw. I'm a student in the undergraduate program at Columbia University. Um, my question pertains to what can we do now? Um, you all talked very eloquently about just the different policies and how um, one of the comments that was made was about how nutrition and presenting it to the government as this is a national issue. Um, but for the people who are younger, like the younger generations now, in terms of like diet, in terms of ch climate change, how can we partake um, in changing the outcome? Yeah, that. Who wants to take that? That very important yes. question, the all important question, what do we do? I'll, I'll be, I just see it from one angle, and this is from my background as a teacher. I think if we're talking about uh, younger people uh, or children and them, you know, getting this into them that this is an important issue that they will be thinking about and that they will be dealing with in their lifetime. Um, I think we need to think about how to integrate it within our education systems. Um, because I, I see a lot of uh, schools or curricula that has gotten rid of these kinds of, of uh, topical issues or uh, topical areas or even subjects. And therefore, um, maybe this is not being discussed uh, in, in the school system. Uh, but I think education would be a way to integrate this so that as people come up, they realize how this is impacting on um, their, their present and into their future. That's just one thought. Well, I think we, you know, obviously we, we have to do more to have an impact on the way governments are allocating resources, deploy, you know, deploying uh, programs. And it's, it's good to sort of look historically you know, the last five to 10 years, we've seen a real upsurge in uh, attention to nutrition. Uh, you know, going back when I was sort of first working uh, in the field, uh, all the attention was on agriculture, agricultural productivity, food security, uh, staple crops and, and the like. And although indirectly they had some impacts on nutrition, we weren't really talking about nutrition, and the nutritionists were sitting in labs and working in basements of ministries of health and, and the like. They were not well supported. Uh, but I think I'll, there's, there's been big improvements over the last decade. There's a, an initiative you're probably aware of called SUN, Scaling Up Nutrition. So the Scaling Up Nutrition movement um, was led by David Nabarro. It, it is now uh, the SUN platform uh, has been adopted by over 60, uh, 60 countries, I think it is now. And yes, eyes glaze over when you say it's a multi-stakeholder platform. But the, the reality is, just like we've been saying, you need multiple organisations to come together to solve the problem. And it's starting to happen. I mean, it, it may not be happen happening fast enough. Start to look, you know, the fact that nutrition is 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 in the Sustainable Development Goals. It's explicitly mentioned in SDG 2. Uh, it appears in SDG 3 and, you know, various aspects of the other SDGs are there as well. And again, eyes usually glaze over when we start talking about SDGs, but I know for a fact, going around country to country, these things are influencing, these goals are influencing national uh, programs, program designs. You know, you're very commonly seeing now uh, uh, if not necessarily the state leaders, but 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 certainly high-level people, including first lady of some org some countries, being the champion of improved nutrition, and it's just sort of elevating the game, I think, in ways that we haven't seen before. So I, I would just say there is progress going on, probably not as fast as we would all like, but I think there's some very encouraging signs in many countries uh, on the nutrition front. 
Just add one thing there, which is, has been alluded to before, but it's very difficult to do a lot of the things that we might like to do without the data. So, I mean, it seems to me that one of the first and most obvious things that needs to happen is the integration of the climate surveillance and the health surveillance in such a way that we can put the apples and the oranges together and they become the same thing. Um, and until we're able to do that, we're going to struggle to, um, you know, to, to answer some of the questions we really want to answer. Jillian and I spent a, a complicated day yesterday trying to map what data we have for Bangladesh on the climate and the, and the nutrition side. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a messy problem. Um, and uh, we should really be solving it up front by setting up those systems um, rather than trying to piece it all together after the fact. To add to that, it gets even more complicated when you think of nutrition as diets, because one of the great gaps that we have um, in most low middle income countries is lack of good dietary intake data over time. Um, there's FAO stat, but that's only national, it can't be disaggregated. And even that, that comes directly from production statistics and not actually from what people are actually eating. So there's a lot of work that can be done around trying to use other data sets mm -hmm. to come up with quasi-intake data, but we, we don't have quality historical intake data. I might, sorry, I was just going to say a positive from an education standpoint. I think it's really positive that there are these new programs that are called food systems programs. I know some, um, the, there was a mention of the one at Columbia, there's one at Rutgers, there's, one at, there's um, programs at other universities as well. And I think what's positive about this is that it is bringing together all these different um, disciplines together and training students to be able to answer these complex problems, bringing in different disciplinary lenses. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Tasfai, I'm from Ethiopia. I work in Ethiopian Public Health Institute, and I'm also a PhD student in Wageningen University. So I have two questions. Uh, my first question is on the solution you suggested. So one of the solution is um, providing improved seeds. But um, from my experience in Ethiopia, one of the key challenges is uh, supplying the improved seeds. Farmers now, nowadays they are aware of the importance of having improved seeds, but getting the improved seeds is a big challenge. The demand is very way far from the supply we have at the moment. And the key challenge, the other key challenge is they cannot reuse the improved seeds varieties. But uh, they also say from like for example before they can use their their indigenous seeds they can reuse it again so they can put part of the, their their products as a seed also for next round so this has, these are also the challenge so how how do you see the practicality of like providing improved seeds uh, or covering that part and, and also the aspect of agriculture diversity and also dietary diversity issue, because most of the improved seeds are also, they are focusing on mainly on cereal-based kind of uh, varieties. So they are not really targeting all different food groups or to, to meet their dietary diversity. So this is my first question. And the second one is, um, as a country now, for example, we are a SUN member country, Ethiopia is a SUN member country, and we used to implement uh, nutrition, a multi-sectoral approach. But it's really challenging for us because it is just uh, at high level, we, we say it is multi-sectoral, but when you go to uh, at grassroots level, it's very challenging to implement with multi-sectoral manner. How do you think it will be practical to see those climate change, food system, and nutrition are really interlinked and see it at the ground? Uh, how, how can a country can assure that kind of uh, practice? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. Those are really great questions. So in terms of seeds, yes, obviously income is going to be 
a problem. If you don't have access to credit or enough income to buy improved seeds, it's going to be not possible to do that. So I think one of the leverage points is also increasing access to credit for farmers so that they can, imp they can buy improved seeds if they want to. Um, I mean, I know I keep saying this, but there are all these different entry points that need to happen in order for um, production to be increasing and for the production of nutrient-rich foods to be increasing. Um, in terms of saving the seeds, obviously that is another problem. I know with improved seeds, it's hard. Um, oftentimes they can't, they can't save them or reuse them for the second year. So um, that's obviously a consideration. There's trade-offs to everything, and I think that is one of the trade-offs. Um, related to seed use. In terms of dietary diverse, or agricultural diversity and dietary diversity, obviously from a nutrition perspective, you want farmers to be growing more crops. So not just focusing on one crop, but even if it's intercropping in some ways, then you at least have a second crop. Um, but diverse farms tend to be associated with diverse diets among the household members, and diverse diets tend to be associated with increased nutrient intakes. So we want farmers to be diversi diversifying their production, not just from a nutrition perspective, but also from a climate resiliency perspective. Um, your question related to multi-sectoral approaches and how do you actually do that on the ground, that's really difficult and I don't have all the answers or any of the answers. One thing I can say is one thing that I um, worked on in Senegal is getting the agricultural extension workers to work with community health workers and we train them together. So maybe on top of that, you can have that third group that are the Met Services people or some sort of integration of all those groups so that you can get information um, that's useful for all of those groups and that they can use those, um, those, whether it be climate services or what have you, in practice. But I don't, I don't have the solutions. And I think probably there are people here that are much better positioned to be able to provide those solutions. Anyone else on that? Those important questions? Glenn? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, you're right. It's challenging, right? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to dispute that. No, it's easy to transform agriculture. Uh, you know, Africa broadly, and uh, Ethiopia specifically, which I'm reasonably familiar with, has started a lot later than other parts of the world in terms of trying to transform its agriculture into a more commercial agricultural system. Uh, that means connecting farmers to markets. And one of the major challenges in Africa is physical infrastructure, the ability to connect farmers to markets, both the input markets and the output markets. If you basically look at the situation in Asia, many of those challenges no longer exist. Farmers are very well connected. Farmers do use hybrids. Farmers are quite happy to buy seeds every year because they're integrated into a commercial system. The level of public investment in Africa in agriculture, despite, again, a lot of improvements over the last decade or so, is still way behind where it is in, in other parts of the world. Ethiopia, in fact, I think has been making more investments than, than most in this area, but it's still, you know, you think of the numbers of farmers and the kind of reach that you need to integrate those farmers both to the input market and the output market. There's just a lot more investment that needs to be done. And, and that's, the biggest mistake has been to think that the private sector will fill up all those gaps because that doesn't happen. It didn't happen in other parts of the world. It won't happen in Africa. You need public sector, sort of a public sector investment foundation for the kinds of changes that you're talking about to take place. I want to bring in another layer to this conversation, maybe particularly for <laughs> Jillian working in Bangladesh and Rugi in, in uh, Kenya is that we've been focusing on climate services and understanding at the kind of farmer level, household level, but if we think about the big trends in the world, we have more and more people living in, in cities, and that will certainly continue into the future. And that puts a, whole, a different uh, set of demands on understanding the relations between climate and nutrition and what climate services might be useful because then the distribution system becomes so important, the cascading climate shocks or any kind of shock uh, becomes so important to feeding urban populations. 
So thinking about the kind of climate services and the audiences for those climate services, how do we incorporate the urban, urban diets and the importance of distribution <coughs> systems within countries and also uh, internationally to the extent that there is uh, imports or exports. <laughs> uh, actually, that's a question that I've, you know, when, when we think about the trends, uh, the transitions, nutrition transitions that are going on in places like uh, Kenya and in Africa, uh, we are seeing a move away from, you know, we still have a lot of infectious diseases, but more and more of the non-communicable diseases. Uh, so how do we figure out this question of non-communicable diseases and the climate issue? Where are they connected, and how can we come up with data that shows the connection, and therefore, uh, what are some of the issues that may need to be addressed? Um, so, you know, we, we are seeing a rise in, in cancers, we are seeing a rise in, um, in uh, you know, obesity, in, in diabetes, and so on, lung disease, a lot of pollution in the cities. Um, we are also seeing that the way food is grown is different in the urban setting compared to the rural setting. So a lot of uh, small farms that are, uh, you know, in places that are in highly populated uh, neighborhoods, sometimes in the informal settlements, um, using very contaminated water. And some of this water that is used for growing this food is um, coming out of industry coming from homes, coming from, you know, sanitation, poor sanitation issues, and ending up in the food system. Uh, so there, there have been a, a number of studies over the last few years in Nairobi tracking vegetables and looking at the food safety of vegetables and um, contamination levels. And almost 80% of the vegetables that are sold in a place like Nairobi are contaminated with high metal, uh, with uh, insects, with you know, all kinds of, of pollut pollutants. Um, these are being fed into the food system. And there is no way that you can actually control it at the household level of saying, I'm going to be careful about where I shop because it's almost everywhere. Um, so that is one, you know, part of that is driven by the fact that these farmers, these urban farmers are depending on uh, refuse water because they do not have a source to clean water. So they have to use what is available to them to farm. Um, and then, you know, this ends up in the market. And as you know, food that is grown in such environments tends to actually look very good, very nice, um, and therefore it's more marketable. Um, so, you know, the question, I don't know if I'm answering the question. I think I'm asking questions here. Uh, Non-communicable diseases, how do we fit it into this climate discussion, where is the connection, where is the data, how do we link it up and, uh, so that we understand it and know what to do about it. And secondly, uh, the food safety, food um, issue as it's driven by um, uh, climate change. Well, it was a good question because it made me think and I don't think I'll be able to answer it fully, but um, one of the things that's done currently, of course, with um, that would be better to have a more forecasting for is seeing about uh, rice yields and other grain yields in country, and then they make sure that they will import enough to support urban environments and make sure that uh, grain prices do not peak. However, there's a lot less forecasting, but also a lot less uh, action around other food items. It's really just focused around grains. There's a few other food items which they'll try to take action for, like onions. But other than that, around horticulture, there's no government program to make sure that people can buy regularly priced produce, and that might be something that could be done in the future. This isn't answering the question in any way, but um, one thing that um, Marugi's comments made me think about, which goes to the first question about acceptability, is uh, food safety. So in a lot of developing countries, there's a lot of food safety issues. And what is happening in some cases is that people are 
tending to find foods that are packaged or processed to be safer because they trust those sources. And so then they become more acceptable. And then when we put that in the context of diet-related non-communicable diseases, that's obviously problematic. So I'm not really sure where climate services fit in terms of helping address that, but um, perhaps in terms of addressing some of the food safety risks. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out, out there as one potential thing to consider moving forward. Just okay. Sorry. Let's take them in sequence so we make sure that we have enough time to answer your questions. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Roy Brown. I'm a, a pediatrician, and I'm very interested in the discussion so far. Uh, the uh, in 2018, this is. A surprise to me that there are still people who deny that there's such a thing as climate change. Um, I'd like to hear the panel's comments on three issues. One, how to convince politicians uh, of the importance of these issues. Two, the importance of poverty uh, worldwide and especially in, in developed countries. And three, the fact that corruption influences a lot of the decisions that are made and a lot of the facts that, that exist. Thank you. A minor question. <laughs> Let's take your question, please, and we'll try to bundle them. Well, those are two uh, great f sets of questions for a lightning round from the panel <laughs> to, to, uh, to sum up here the big questions, how do we, what do we do? <laughs> Where should we start? Glenn? <laughs> uh, well, I think climate, the, the climate deniers, I think, uh, or at least governments that don't take uh, climate seriously, I think that's one of one of the core messages of the Act Today project is that climate affects us today. Don't get hung up about, you know, going underwater in 50 years' time or, and the sort of the catastrophic long-term uh, trends which are real but generally don't affect today's politicians or, frankly, today's generation of, of you know, it's just not on the radar. So that's why sort of mitigation is, is not a big deal, you know, for a lot of folks except a country like China that will actually see the impact because it's so big and the population so 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 much affected. So, you know, I, I think just making the point that climate is affecting us here and now and uh, taking advantage of events like Hurricane Florence uh, and other uh, such uh, catastrophes and making the point that this is happening now. It's not something we're worried about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. I think that's a, that would be part of, part of the answer, I think. Um, following directly on from that, um, I would say more than even just making the point, we need to demonstrate the point. You know? We need evidence beyond just beyond changes in climate that are being observed, what about ch impacts that changes in climate are having on different sectors? So, you know, um, the, a couple of the slides that you were talking about and rightly referencing some of the uncertainties to do with the modeling, we're looking at long-term changes that might be projected in nutritional outcomes from climate change. What about attributing changes that we've seen over the historical record? Can we demonstrate a uh, number of people affected by, by different types of climate impacts from the observed record? Um, and can we actually try and publicize some of those, some of those numbers um, to people who are accountable? Comments? Let me just say, uh, I think when it comes to climate deniers, um, the, 
you know, it's, 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 it's a political issue in this country. So there are people who have, you know, they have the information, they have the data, but they choose to deny it. Uh, this may not be the case in a lot of other countries. In a lot of other countries, um, probably they, they are aware that there is this going on, and therefore maybe not to the degree that you know, the evidence and the data is, is in place, and maybe then we need to, to present them with the data to convince them that they need to take this as a priority. It's just that there are so many other competing priorities that they think you know, they can address this tomorrow. They are thinking about educating children, they are thinking about building hospitals, and so on. And so I think the leadership um, in such countries would need more convincing to see this as a priority, that even as they deal with other, these other issues that they are dealing with, this is something that they need to also uh, really think about and uh, start um, addressing. Okay, thank you. We are out of time of this panel, but I'll just say that, uh, that what we're doing here is forging this new frontier between nutrition and climate and getting at, at the climate through what is so clearly important for the health of individuals and the health of economies is, uh, is one way to bring in the climate issue through the health issue. Um, so to, to wrap up, I'd just like to thank our, our very insightful panelists and, and for your questions and let's give them a hand.
uh, uh, 55 minutes, is um, present to you a book that we have developed collectively to try and help the health sector engage more proactively, uh, maybe more practically, with climate and climate information services. And some of you will have seen a um, leaflet outside. We only have one or two copies of the book here, unfortunately. It is now available, um, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that um, uh, uh, during the panel. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Madeleine Thompson. I work at the IRI, and uh, I have a position here in environmental health sciences. So it's a really big pleasure to have uh, the uh, community uh, together here. Uh, my own personal background is I trained as an animal and plant biologist and then as an entomologist and then specialised in medical entomology and got very much involved in the health sector through programmes such as the BedNet programme for malaria, through the Onchocerciasis Control programme, etc. So my own personal background is very much in the biological sciences but have moved into this rather odd space of uh, being a health specialist embedded for the last 16 years in a climate uh, institution uh, where I've been leading the health work uh, for some time. And um, uh, the IRI has been a WHO collaborating centre since 2004. Uh, we're a collaborating centre on malaria early warning systems and other climate sensitive diseases. And I've led that centre since 2011. Um, so, I want to give you the rationale for actually just sitting down and writing the book. My co-editor, Simon Mason, who is the chief climate scientist at the IRI, is wrapping up his class downtown where he's teaching climate science, again, to non-climate scientists. So um, that's very much part of the mission of the IRI, but he will be here with us at least for the reception. And the book is very much a collaboration between two disciplines. How? Should one, as a non-climate person, understand the climate people when they're talking, and how should they understand us? So um, I'm going to just, before I invite my um, co-authors uh, to the panel, I just want to show you the shape of the book, and then invite them, and then we'll hear about their experiences uh, engaging uh, also in this space. So the contents of the book is 10 chapters, and what I always find most important is to always put the policymakers up front. What is the policy context for what we're discussing? And I say that because it just stops you spending a lot of time working on things that nobody cares about. So if this is an important area, then policymakers will be engaging it in one way or another and looking for some resources that may help them in their decision. So the first one is trying to understand the policy landscape a little bit, and particularly for students to understand why a shift from the MDGs to the SDGs, the uh, Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, is very important in the context of climate services for the health sector. The health sector uh, under the MDGs was very much functioning as a silo structure, with malaria as a really dominant animal uh, in that whole process. Under the SDGs, it's much more integrated. Health has to be much more integrated with environment, and environment and climate is there really clearly expressed, whereas under the MDGs, it really was very weakly expressed. Um, then there, there's a chapter on how climate impacts on disasters. We've already heard a lot about that in the earlier panel. And then how we can connect climate information, which is not the same as climate impacts. It's actually, do we have the information that we could use to actually change some of these outcomes? And then we have a, a wonderful series of chapters um, uh, led by Simon Mason and Hannah Nissan, who you heard on the earlier panel, on the basics of climate for a non-climate person. How does climate variability and trends work? What are the key drivers from seasonality to uh, El Nino to longer term trends being driven uh, by climate change? And uh, then a lot of issues around the data, and we already heard about that in the panel, the importance of understanding the data. And what you tend to get in multidisciplinary communities is your own data is really precious. You think it is really complicated and that nobody understands it and loves it like you do. But then people go out and they just go on the internet, pick up somebody else's data and slap it in there without any question as to what that data actually represents, what the source is, uh, how it was created, etc., etc. And that's something 
uh, that we think that is important to um, deal with. Uh, then there's a chapter on weather forecasting, which we tend to, everybody here deals with weather forecasts. We get up in the morning, is it going to be sunny this afternoon? Is it going to be rainy? Is there going to be a storm? Um, we complain when it doesn't work, etc. But what are the underlying principles and where do weather forecasts work? Well, and why don't they work uh, sometimes? And where don't they work, etc.? And then thinking about longer term uh, issues around seasonal climate, how predictable that is, and that's where it's very important to understand uh, the El Nino, southern oscillation, and that, how that impacts on the global climate. But that doesn't do that everywhere. So where does it matter? Uh, and again, uh, thinking about longer term uh, climate issues and adapting uh, to longer term climate change. And then there's a summary chapter, which we hope will help pull all that together and make it easy to digest for the non-climate community. But I also uh, think there's relevant cross pathways with the climate community's engagement as well. So with that very brief introduction, um, I would like to uh, invite our panel to the table. And um, uh, so we have Tama uh, Rabi from the World Bank. I'm just going to invite you all, Angel Munoz, uh, Wilmot, and uh, Jeff, Jeff Shetman. And the way we're going to do this is um, the book is now, like I said, it's available. You can buy it. I'm quite happy if you buy it. We get 5% royalties, which will go into distributing books. But it's also freely available online. And that's really important. You can go to Routledge. You can download the whole book. You can access the supplementary materials, etc., etc. So that is the background information on the book itself. I would like now to um, uh, invite the panel, um, starting with uh, Tamarabi uh, from the World Bank, to express why they think it's important to have an informed donor, policy, research, health, community, uh, and how we might best enable that. So I'd like to hand it over to you, uh, Tamar, to first introduce yourself and to give your thoughts. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tamar Rabi. I'm a lead health um, specialist at the uh, World Bank, working in the World Bank's health, nutrition, and population global practice. I'm a medical doctor by training, an epidemiologist uh, by vocation, and I joined the World Bank about uh, 13 years ago, working on health operations in uh, developing countries on a number of um, different regions, East Asia, um, Central Asia, and currently on the Middle East and North Africa region. I'm also the uh, climate change health focal point for the uh, for the World Bank. Um, what I will try and do today is uh, perhaps in my in these remarks is just really to focus on three main issues that uh, address what um, what Madeline has asked us to talk about. And I think the first one is something that you probably have heard already quite a bit today, and probably also through your work you already know quite enough of. And that really is, why should we be focusing on climate change and health? Why is it of importance to us? Why is it of importance to policymakers and how we can make the case to policymakers, as we've heard from the previous session, which is obviously not always that, um, that easy. And I know that uh, one of my colleagues, Wilmot, will also be talking a little bit about that and how to take, incorporate that, particularly with those people that are not necessarily related to, um, to climate change um, um, work or the evidence um, around that. So that will be the first point that I'd like to make, and, and I'll go very briefly over that just to refresh our memories. The second thing is really what also comes out quite vividly in this book, is, which is basically why the need for these information systems for public health action um, to be able to address climate change. And I want to very briefly talk also about that um, to emphasize a few points that are also coming up in the book, but really that take or adopt a public health approach um, to how we deal with climate change. And the third point is perhaps um, to shed some light on what the World Bank is doing in terms of climate change um, and the focus on climate uh, financing and how we're addressing this climate change and health nexus. So I'll start off at the beginning with that, why the focus on climate change and health? And being from the World Bank, um, um, our two twin goals that we are working towards is the elimination or the er eradication of extreme poverty 
and um, uh, increasing shared prosperity among populations. And based on all the work and research that has been done, it's very clear that with climate change, um, we're, we're probably very far from achieving those two twin goals if, we, if those don't become core and central to what um, we do in the, in the international um, development uh, community. And therefore, that's by far one of the biggest triggers for why that focus needs to be there. But also as emphasized in the book, and I, and I chose this particular uh, diagram from the book to, to show today, is I think we need to try and emphasize the fact that climate um, impacts on health directly and indirectly, but it also has impacts on the economy and it impacts on the socioeconomics of our, the, the populations of the people we work with and we work for. Um, and it can be modulated through health, but it can be a direct also impact from um, climate uh, variability or extreme weather events in itself. And I'm not gonna focus too much on these direct or indirect impacts, but I just wanna be able to put out the, some figures for us to refresh our memories why we're all here today. In terms of the impacts of climate change, we know that by the year 2030 to 2050, we probably will be seeing an additional 250,000 deaths occurring per year as a result of, um, of climate change. And mind you, this is a very conservative estimate based on a subset of some of the direct impacts from climate change. It does not necessarily consider uh, the indirect impacts or even the impacts from migration and conflict that may occur as a result. In terms of morbidity, of course, this is not strange to any of us, but we will be seeing, obviously, a rise in infectious diseases. And it's a result, a result of um, transmission patterns that will likely change as a result of, um, of uh, climate change with changing vector ranges, um, increased, obviously, risk for food and waterborne um, diseases. And from another perspective, I mentioned it a little while ago, this whole issue around migration, uh, which somehow tends to get forgotten in the, in the whole discussion around climate change. But they will, climate change will impact on um, internal displacements of populations. This in itself, obviously, will be affecting quite a number of people. And based on some estimates that we've done in the World Bank, we're looking at nearly 140 million people by 2050 in Africa, Latin America, and Asia that may be impacted by um, climate change um, forced migrations. That in itself can have huge negative Im health impacts. In terms of the economic impacts, I guess that one of the big things that obviously need to be um, put on the table, particularly in discussions with um, ministers of finance, for example, that may not necessarily think so much about climate change or putting money or resources into climate change. Well, based on estimates that have been, um, that have been modeled uh, for how much it would be costing the world, um, should we actually not intervene on, 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 on in climate change, the direct costs are estimated to be anywhere between two to four uh, billion US dollars uh, per year by the year 2030. Not only that, we're also estimating that nearly 100 million, 100 million people would be pushed into extreme poverty by um, 2030 if um, no further interventions are, are taken into addressing climate change. And of course, as we've heard um, uh, previously in other panel discussions, climate change is also highly likely that it's going to be magnifying uh, the effect of natural disasters, which already are a pretty uh, big, um, uh, they total to a pretty big number in terms of uh, dollars lost uh, per year. And we're looking at around $500 billion per year as a result of natural disasters that could even be further aggravated. So that was the why are we all here? I guess the second point for us is why the need for information systems. And, and here I'd like to really look at it uh, through a public health um, approach. And if we all recall the four main steps to this public health approach, step one is in terms of surveillance. And it is important, obviously, to highlight here that when we're thinking about, um, you know, health information systems, that they are needed at each one of those, um, in each one of those public health approaches. And climate change, obviously, or climate action, should be no exception to this. So, in terms of surveillance, obviously, it's critical, and we are in the process now of doing so to develop indicators that can actually measure climate impacts. 
And this is by far one of the most difficult jobs to do because of so many methodological issues, particularly related to causality and attribution of uh, financing, if you will, of resources going into, into climate action. The second step is in identifying risks and uh, protective factors. And this is an important element when, from an information perspective. In how do we identify those that are most at risk uh, from climate change and climate variability? But equally so, it's not just about identifying the, those that are most at risk, but also identifying the sources of greenhouse gas emissions that may, be, that may be emanating from within the health sector itself. And this is a, a whole different way of thinking about the role of the health sector in climate mitigation. So it's not just about the focus on climate adaptation, but what is our role as health professionals and health policymakers and development partners and donors in uh, being able to mitigate um, the effects of climate change. Step three in the public health approach is all about developing solutions. And in, in this particular case, looking at it from a, um, an information systems perspective, it really is all about trying to come up with the evidence base of what is effective or not so in terms of addressing um, climate change and developing obviously tailored, if you will, um, climate services to address um, those needs. And step four is in terms of implementation, and that obviously takes us into the entire discussion around monitoring and evaluation and the role of advocacy for um, climate action. So that was why it's important for us to think about um, information systems. I'll end the, the final part of, uh, of my remarks today on what we have been doing at the World Bank. And I want to start with a, with a few things um, just to highlight what the World Bank has been doing in terms of increasing its uh, work on climate change and its commitment to climate change. And the first thing that I'd like to perhaps highlight is that the bank back in 2015, we developed um, a climate change action plan. What I'm, sh what I'm showcasing here or highlighting is the health sector specific climate change action plan. And this is not just, um, you know, this is not just ink on paper that we've put, but we're actually taking it very seriously to the extent that our president, uh, Dr. Jim Kim, has, um, has been pushing the agenda quite aggressively inside the organization. And we have committed ourselves to increasing um, climate financing for climate co-benefits um, last, last fiscal year to reach 28% of all bank financed um, operations to go towards climate um, co-benefits. Now, what in the health sector, what we have been doing, starting from a portfolio that actually had no co-benefit operations whatsoever, 0%, back in 2000, fiscal year of 2014, uh, by fiscal year 2018, and our fiscal year runs from, June, from July to, to June, so i.e. by end of June of 2018 this year, uh, we have seen 29% of our new World Bank operations, including climate um, co-benefit interventions. In, them. in dollar terms, that was approximately 280 uh, million US uh, dollars that went into financing health operations in a number of different countries, I mean, including India, Egypt, Bolivia, Bangladesh, and the list goes on. Um, and then. In terms of what the bank has been doing across all sectors, because it's not just about the health sector, but it's the interplay between health, environment, energy, agriculture, how we, you can bring all those sectors together around the table, our investments have been huge. We've committed to 28%. We've actually reached 33% uh, this last fiscal year in terms of how, we, how much money we've put into climate financing. That, in dollar terms, was 15%. Um, $0.7 billion just this last fiscal year. The other thing that we're working on, and we've had a chance to discuss um, over lunch briefly with, uh, with Madeline and colleagues, is that we're now thinking beyond this action plan, which was taking us only up until 2020, and it was really focused mostly on inputs. We're now trying to take this into another level, which is, well, how can we measure impacts from these you know, climate uh, financing operations that we're uh, putting money into. So our post-2020 targets, which the bank probably will be speaking about um, in uh, the upcoming COP, will really be focusing on how do we measure climate impacts 
and what would be the targets for those. And that's probably going to be a discussion that we would like to have also with, uh, with partners. So apart from this uh, climate change action plan, um, I'm very quickly just to mention that we've done also a number of diagnostics and, uh, um, and analytical work. I mean, I'm just going to showcase very quickly. I mean, these are all available online. We did, a, we did a number of vulnerability assessments for countries to be able to assess their readiness, if you will, to um, cope and adapt to climate change and their, uh, the possibilities of putting investments in mitigation strategies for those countries. Also, we did a, an analysis of, of hotspots um, across the globe to be able to identify countries where we feel they may be our biggest priorities or the biggest areas of, of, um, of focus. And uh, we have now also moved into a, um, an era where all bank projects, before they are presented to the World Bank Board, have to be screened for um, climate um, adaptation and mitigation. And it's, um, it's across all sectors. My concluding remarks are four, and I will stop there. First one is that climate change definitely is now core and central to what we are doing, not just in the World Bank, but across um, the uh, international uh, development um, arena. And that it's become a cross-cutting solution area for, for the bank as an institution. The second thing is that mainstreaming of climate change and health um, has been um, taken quite seriously by our senior management, in fact, We've now established a team just dedicated on um, climate change and health. No more is it a one-man show of uh, one person trying to do this. The um, next point is the fact that we have been now working and developed um, a um, new product that is actually looking at climate smart healthcare. And how is it that we could, from a health sector, look at greening the sector? And what would be the role of the health sector in doing that? And I want to end on the note that of, um, as um, Madeline was mentioning in the introduction, that obviously now with the shift um, to the SDGs, our main focus is really on universal health coverage. And this target of 3.8 of the SDGs focusing on universal health coverage, it is actually far more important now than ever that climate smart healthcare becomes a part of how we do UHC. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, I think you can hear me. So my name is Angel Muñoz, or Angel. Some people like to, you know, my English, the English version. Uh, I'm a climate physicist, actually, originally a theoretical physicist. Just imagine I was born in Venezuela, and then at some point I started to uh, work with uh, national med services and ministries. Some of those were ministries of health in Latin America. And, you know, long story short, I arrived to uh, IRI, I'm a climate scientist there, working um, in the climate group, but also very closely with Madeleine Thompson on climate and health applications. And, uh, you know, in order to um, answer the question that uh, Madeleine asked me to discuss with you guys, um, which is about, you know, what are the re research needs, and I'm going to say the general needs between the climate community and the health community, I'm just going to go back to that panel in 2000, well, that uh, meeting in 2016. Yeah. yeah, so we were over there. And it was super interesting uh, for me to see, um, and this is one of the topics that I'm going to be mentioning, and it's super uh, funny that I'm going to be talking about the lack of communication between the climate and the health communities. Because that's what, because that's what we always hear that is, uh, you know, important to attack. But I'm going to try to, you know, uh, not only say that, I'm going to mention a, a few other things, but there, at least it was my experience, when we were talking about the importance of climate, what we heard is that is a key for um, climate change. But I think that we heard several times before um, earlier this day that um, climate change is one of the time scales that we're interested in. 
as uh, has been mentioned, Act Today is underscoring, underlining the importance of preparing for uh, the climate today. So we start today in order to get ready for, you know, all future um, time scales. And in order to do that, we need to understand context. And that's why communication is so important. So something that it was super interesting to me again in that uh, conference, in that meeting is, everyone was asking Madeline and I about, oh, are you working with this team or that team? They are doing all the climate change work and we really want concrete solutions for now. That's what they, they were saying. And, and we were, yeah, yeah, so we work at IRI and we know the importance of the now. So I'm gonna say that the main problem, again, is that lack of you know, a, a common language, not only communication, but a common language between these two communities. And the idea is to have concrete solutions. It's not, again, about, it's not about the communication between concrete solutions. And, you know, this is, I think, a concrete solution. And I was involved, you know, just, you know, a very little because uh, uh, Madeline, Simon, and uh, Hannah and others, you know, wrote most of it. But this is, I think, a, a very nice uh, initiative and solution in order to try to speak a common language. And this is more on the, I totally understand, my, you know, some of you might say, well, this is more on the, what is the climate language that the health community might um, be able to use, you know, or, or what is the experience or the knowledge on the climate side that the, the health community might be able to use, and we also need like the other side. Um, but this is already a lot, of, these um, two lead scientists, Madeline Thompson and Simon Mason, they are expert and have a lot of experience, you know, international experience on how to speak this common language. And they have done an amazing job. I don't know if you already took a look at the book and originally thought I'm just going to read a few chapters, but no. But I do have my notes on the book, so I'm, I'm going to read a few, a few things uh, in the book. So I think that what we need is that common language, for example, through trainings. At IRI, we have, we have had these uh, summer institutes and a lot of trainings in terms of, you know, trying to create this uh, common landscape for climate and health. And I think that, um, you know, this is uh, something that we have done not only in terms of climate and health, but also, and again, in, in the context of ACT today, for agriculture. There are amazing examples out there where we are talking um, not only to the um, ag, the agriculture modeler, we're talking directly, you know, through the entire chain of, of information to the end user, and we can have a common language, a common landscape of you know, knowledge that we can share both ways. And that's something that we are exploring in ACT today has been mentioned before. So, you know, something um, that might, you know, maybe slightly related to that uh, uh, figure that Madeline suggested for this uh, part of the panel is that we all know that climate varies at multiple time scales. So it's not only about, about climate change, it's about whether the next few if you want now cast in the next few hours, weather, the next few days, and then you know, the next few months and so on, decades until climate change. And climate is related, is intimately related to a lot of other systems that we have in the Earth, on, in the, on planet Earth. And same as climate varies on multiple time scales, health does it. And when we talk, for example, has been mentioned before, we, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, malaria, you know, about the climate and health system, for example, for infectious diseases, like vector-borne diseases like malaria. Um, we really need to understand how this very complex system of vectors, the mosquitoes, for example, um, parasites or virus, if we want to talk about Zika, we recently had, you know, a big epidemic on Zika, and the human system, these are by themselves very complex systems. And we have something that is bigger than that, that is like interacting. And if we really want to attack this problem, if we really want to offer solutions for society, we need to work together and that's why we need to have better communication and solutions like the Summer Institute of this great book. Simon just arrived, so I was just saying that it was terribly written. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you know, coming back to, uh, to the point, so, what are the concrete needs that we might uh, attack? So this kind of common language needs to be translated, in, translated um, in something like, do we actually, can we actually, if we want to forecast, let's say, when is gonna be the next Zika epidemic or Aedes-born diseases in general for the US, 
So Hannah and others were making the case before of we need this common language also in terms of a common surveillance system. We need climate data and we need you know, health data, I'm going to call it like that, like in general, uh, that are compatible. So we can actually do something in terms of, if, if that's what we want, like forecasting uh, probability of occurrence of this particular disease. So Tamara was mentioning that we expect, because of the climate change scenarios, that in the future it might increase. But the truth is that this translation also means contextual information. So if the temperature is too high, the mosquito and the virus might actually die. So if, if temperature goes really, really high, in some places we actually might see, might see a decrease of the disease. So this is when, you know, this is how we, we propose, like we just sit and try to have amazing things like these books, like the summer institute that we um, had at IRI and the trains that we have all around the world in those terms. So this uh, data compatibility and trying to understand this relationship, Hannah was talking also about the explained variance, like how much, how important is climate for the health system? For malaria, because of the particularities of the mosquitoes and the parasite, it's, it's higher. So our forecasts tend to be better when we do something for malaria than when we talk about Zika or dengue. That understanding is extremely important. That's kind of the research needs that we require and how that can be translated into something at the end, like useful for decision makers and society. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I'd uh, just like to um, take the opportunity to welcome Simon Mason uh, to the panel, and uh, I also saw a number of the Climate and Society students, so welcome too. Um, I think what we'll do, we'll, we'll carry on with the panel for the moment, and then Simon, I'll ask you to make some comments. Yeah, so I'd like to pass it now to Wilmot James. The floor is yours. So thank you very much, Madeline. So my name is Wilmot James. I'm a visiting professor um, in Physicians and Surgeons and the School for International and Public Affairs. Um, I have an academic ba background, but I ran two institutes uh, in South Africa, both political institutes, and I spent nine years as a member of the South African Parliament responsible for science, technology, and health. And it's partly from that experience that I'll try to address some questions about the role of governments in the public sector in advancing the issues that have been raised uh, in the book and in the whole area of uh, climate change and health in particular. So, and let me just start by saying that um, you would have noticed that, uh, that when it came to the tsunami that hit the city of Palu and other low-lying areas in Indonesia for this past weekend, the Financial Times carried this quite extraordinary story of the costly consequences, as you know, it's more than 1,200 people have uh, established um, as having been killed, uh, of that nation that is Indonesia's surprisingly dysfunctional disaster management system. Um, the reporter wrote that the tsunami, and I'm quoting, followed two tremors of magnitude 6.1 and 7.5 after the disaster agency had lifted an alert. The warning system, which was set up after the 2004 tsunami, uh, in which 120,000 people died, appears to have failed. The disaster management agency said that funding had been cut and that none of the tsunami, I think you call it here, you pronounce it as buoys, uh, which is the type of instrument used to detect waves, None of them had been operative in Indonesia since 2012. Why the Indonesia's apparent failure to maintain its early warning system comes as a surprise, I'll explore at another occasion, because Indonesia's been at the forefront of trying to deal with uh, emergency response in the area of health, one of the leading countries. Uh, but for today's purposes, this human tragedy there highlights a number of issues about the role of legislators, the role of policymakers and the role of politicians in turning climate information into public action, which is the title of the book that we are discussing today. As emergency response is almost always a public sector response and not a private sector one, it is clear that whomsoever may be in office in any country at whatever time, there has to be a consistent, sustained, transparent, 
an accountable uh, funding flow into developing the people expertise, the information generation, and the infrastructure that is required to detect, to prevent, and to respond to catastrophic events, whether they are a consequence of natural events like an earthquake or extreme weather or accidents or terrorism. In the instance of climate change, that means consistent, sustained, transparent, and accountable funding into the professional development of climate and weather experts, into MET services, and into the infrastructure required for the rapid collection, the management, and the analysis of mass data. As everyone well knows, credible decisions can rarely be taken without having access to quality data, uh, that is, data of reasonable quality, because perfect information is often simply not possible or what arrives too late. Now, it is one thing to have good data. It is quite another matter to communicate the key findings um, that's contained in that data into comprehensible language that legislators and policy making uh, and policy makers working in different countries, in different legislatures, and in different cultures, political cultures can understand. Policy makers may have to be carefully socialized, very carefully socialized into big science projects, because many may, many if not most, have no background in the area, may be scared of it, they typically are, typically are scared of big science, and in fact some might be overtly hostile. This is important not only for legislatures, who have a direct responsibility for knowledge generation and detection, prevention, and response operations, but also, and in particular, for treasuries and finance departments, because they basically have to prioritize, budget for, and decide to allocate the money on a national level. Moreover, a very special effort must be made to build what is known as horizontal governance and horizontal governance alliances. It's normally in, in private companies, what they would do is build alliances across sectors in order to coordinate activity. And most governments, like universities in fact, operate vertically and not horizontally. And therefore a very sustained and financed effort uh, with the right people in the right place have to build what is known as horizontal governance, particularly when it comes to uh, portfolios that um, are cut across a whole range of areas when it comes to issues like climate. So what is important is not only to do that because you need a system of horizontal responses to an issue, but because you also need to break down the barriers between not what's known as hard portfolios and soft portfolios in government. On the one hand, you have intelligence, defense, customs, aviation, and immigration, typically we would be the hard ones, and then you have the soft ones, health, education, science and technology, and so on. And there are massive barriers between those two portfolios. They do not speak the same language. The, the concept of a non-state actor means different things in those different portfolios. There's not a common language, speaking about common language, and there's so often hostility between those departments. And they all have to cooperate when it comes to emergency response, for example, which requires a rapid coordination of activities in terms of um, public affairs uh, in, uh, in that respect. So there's a group of us working at Columbia designing a socialization project, is the word we would use, targeted specifically at politicians and legislators and at people in policy in the area of biosecurity. And uh, biosecurity deals with, uh, not in the environmental sense, but it deals with laboratory security and it deals with uh, oversight protocols when it comes to dual use research and synthetic biology. Um, and, and we're doing this uh, for African politicians together with the Washington DC based agency and as you can well imagine, this is not straightforward when you're speaking with biosecurity, which cuts across defense uh, and health um, and, and science and technology, as an example. As a concept, climate information for public action, this story, 
is part of a very ambitious effort, in my view, and a very good one, to create a voluntary and a cooperative global platform where standardized metrics, standardized technical assessment areas, and standardized public action domains are used to upscale detection, uh, prevention, and response uh, to events, some of them being catastrophic. This is similar in, to, in design to what's known as the global health security agenda when it comes to public health and medical actions uh, in the response to pandemic infectious disease outbreaks. Same story, standardized metrics, technical assessment areas, and public um, uh, health actions applicable to all on a global scale. I mean, it's immensely ambitious, uh, both undertakings. Now, there's one big difference between the two. The climate change project is driven by the developing world to get the developed world to invest in mitigating the consequences of, a, of its often damaging conduct uh, with consequences mostly on the developing world, whereas the global health security project is driven by the developed countries to get developing countries to keep those dangerous bugs from spreading uh, out of the local domains. Now, let me say about accountability, transparency, uh, and the whole question of corruption. The issue has been raised a number of times about government. Uh, Glenn Denning raised the issue, and others have raised the issues. Now, when it comes to investments in emergency systems, uh, and when you invest in the emergency system, you also have to build resilience in standard responses. So you're basically tackling the same thing. And there are no doubt exceptions. But the extraordinary fact that Indonesia apparently failed to invest in and maintain their Earth observational systems for six long years raises the question of whether the transparency and accountability of governments work best in democratic or authoritarian systems. The answer is not straightforward. In democratic systems, we have high levels of freedom, where there's lots of cut and thrust in politics, where public protest can be mobilized, and where citizens who are active in participating in a vibrant democracy are better able to hold governments to account. I think as a general rule, that is what happens. But I must tell you immediately, and we can make the qualifications historically, that in the case of South Africa, it took nine years to reverse a decision taken in a democracy by a president to declare that HIV does not cause AIDS, with huge human consequences. There was a lot of noise, a lot of noise in, the, in, in that democracy. It's young. It has a single party dominant uh, culture, so, and so on. So it's not as vibrant as others, but still. So it doesn't generally work like that. And then you have the example of Singapore, which is authoritarian histories and tendencies that uh, gets a job done in a very efficient manner. Uh, and in the public interest. And so it's not a straightforward question. But the fact is that when I sat in the South African Parliament and we looked at government expenditure, I represented the opposition of the governing party. Uh, and you go through government budgets and you assess government budgets, uh, we would look for four things. We would look for unauthorized expenditure. We would look for fruitless expenditure. Some of these things are self-evident, right? We would look for wasteful expenditure, and then we would look for money that's disappeared. That's corruption, right? So it disappeared in some way or the other. And what you want to do is look at the amount of money that is dedicated to a cause or to a function, and you trace that money through the system to see where it ends up, and it, A, does it end up in the right hands, and what is the quantum? And in various countries, you will see that what ends up in the hands of the destination uh, agency or, or, or people varies anywhere between 20% to 80%. And so what's really important is that those governments must be held accountable for that. There must be accountability system. And the best kind of accountability system is a vibrant democracy where politicians can be punished in some way or the other because they are... Um, across the board subject to uh, the perverse tendencies of human nature. So they have to be held in check. And so you need a political order that can do that. So 
Let me just end off by saying that um, uh, in looking at the role of government and the whole question of climate uh, and, um, and public action, climate information and public action, it's very important, since this is a public sector activity, especially an emergency response, to ensure that countries build climate and climate information into the disaster plans. And if you look at disaster plans globally, um, every city has one. Um, sometimes it's on a state basis or provincial basis. Sometimes it's national, but typically it's actually city-based. Uh, and disaster plans are set against risk areas. In the case of Cape Town, where I'm from, I looked at the disaster plans for the city. It is the only city uh, uh, in the country that has a nuclear power station uh, close by, and it's an old-fashioned disaster plan. Climate information is not in there. Uh, um, and so it's really important for an effort to be made to modernize disaster plans to include climate information. Thank you very much. Jeff to make some remarks. I just have to make a comment about this issue of accountability and I think it is really striking challenge in the whole climate variability to change. It's very easy to make a prediction 50 years out politically and say this is what we need to do because you cannot be held accountable because you won't be there. Your kids will be held accountable, your grandchildren, but not yourself. When you deal with weather timescales and you get a bad weather forecast, that weatherman is accountable the next day. They, they are, you know, so, so the accountability issue comes very much also into climate variability and change planning. I just couldn't resist putting that out there. And now I'd just like to invite Jeff, who leads the climate change and health uh, work here at Mailman, uh, to make some remarks and particularly to think about scaling requires an educated public health force. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and, and speak on this panel. Um, I am going to talk about education, and I do think that this, uh, this book that Simon and Madeline Shepard did it together and wrote is going to be a wonderful resource uh, for informing people and educating uh, the next generation of people who are going to be needed to really address the, the health impacts of climate change. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences here at the Mailman School of Public Health, and I'm also the director of the Climate and Health Program um, here in this school. Uh, this program was founded in 2008. It's the first uh, program explicitly for educating graduate students on climate and health in the country. Uh, we have both a master's of public health program and a certificate that master's students in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences actually and other five of the six departments in, in Mailman are allowed to use this as one of their certificates, as their certificate, uh, and focus on the study of climate and health. And within the curriculum, we teach them atmospheric dynamics, thermodynamics, and radiation. Madeline and Simon lead a course based off this book that actually uses it and uh, uses climate information for public health action. Uh, we teach things on sustainable development, environmental epidemiology, and approaches to pollution, uh, overview of some of the issues that are broadly there. There are issues related to wash, water, and sanitation, and, and human health. Um, we also have doctoral students in it. We actually have nine doctoral students presently in the program. A couple of them are in this room. And uh, we've graduated at this point three um, as a new program coming up. But um, we have a nice set of support. We have a core group of faculty. We have other people around the university who are affiliated uh, with the program there. And we also have a cadre of uh, postdocs within it. And we, we're researching a range of issues uh, related to infectious diseases, mental health, air pollution and health outcomes, heat-related morbidity and mortality. Uh, there's a program on forced migration that we have linkages with. So there are a lot of opportunities and linkages within uh, this sphere that draw upon and try to educate uh, people in the idea of climate and health and what are some of the issues associated with it. And how can we bring people forward who are savvy and conversant in both languages and who can speak to policymakers and affect public health policy as well? Um, one of the other things that we have been doing that I want to talk a little bit about is that we've been, um, we created a, um, a consortium for climate and health education. And, and this is predicated on the idea that uh, if we are going to actually address climate change and the health impacts of climate change in particular, looking at it from the lens of the, the clinical and public health vantage, 
we need to have a more informed set of health professionals. And we need people coming out of schools of nursing, out of schools of medicine, and out of schools of public health with exposure to what's going on in the climate system and how it's impacting human health. And there's a whole range of issues embedded within that. And that has to do with clinical practice. That has to do with hospital administrators and green footprints for them. It has to dealing with emergency management responses and what you do in an emergency, and particularly a climate-related emergency, uh, such as Hurricane Florence, for instance. Uh, majority of doctors report that they're already seeing, and these are practicing clinicians, they're already seeing the health effects of climate change in their practice. A lot of that may be mediated through air pollution. It's got a tremendous amount of effects in terms of respiratory problems, COPD, asthma exacerbations. It's associated with cardiovascular disease, pregnancy dysfunction. It's also associated with uh, neurocognitive developmental issues. So they see this all the time, and they see this in cities around the world. Obviously, places like Beijing and Mumbai are going to pop into a lot of people's heads right now, I would imagine. Um, but we need them to be informed as to what's going on and what are the processes that are at play, what are the linkages, and where the science stands, and why this is an issue that may get worse or better. We need to have it integrated into emergency medical response. We need it integrated into the thinking of the next generation of nurses. So it was with these ideas in mind um, that we at Mailman actually partnered with the White House under the Obama administration at COP21 in Paris and had a side event where we got about 115 schools of public health mostly and some medical schools sign on to a pledge of the idea that they were going to begin to integrate climate and health education into their curricula. Um, and from this, which was a very successful event, we got some seed money, we obtained some seed money from the Rockefeller Foundation to actually start a global consortium dedicated to this proposition. And um, we now, at this point, have 170 schools as members of it. It's mostly U.S. We're working to expand it so that it will include a lot, much wider variety of schools, particularly better representation in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and even Europe. Um, and uh, what we've been doing is we've been crafting a structure for this whole thing. We have an advisory council. We have a coordinating committee. We've invested the time to work with our members to come up with an idea of what are the core competencies that we want people to obtain during this educational process? What do we want clinicians coming out to be able to and capable to deal with and, and work with? What do we want their understanding to be? What are the skill sets we want? We're working and moving towards the idea that just as physicians need to be certified again and there's a certain number of course requirements they have to take, we would like to see climate and health as one of the options for that. Uh, similarly, for public health practice, what are public health practitioners going to see at municipal province, state, national levels, and certainly within places like the WHO. Um, we also have developed what we call a virtual town square, which is a, a place for resource sharing. It offers educational materials, it offers online videos, it offers curricula that people post, it posts the book, the book is posted on there as well. It has events and news and opportunities, it lists job opportunities, and it's there to be a free resource. And all of this stuff that we're doing is freely available to the public and we're going to continue to expand it. So uh, the idea here it really, again, is that we have to promote the idea that health is a central component that is going to be affected by climate change and climate variability and weather, and that people do need to be more cognizant of it. And if we don't educate our frontline clinicians, our nurses, our doctors, as well as our public health professionals, we're not going to actually imbue this into policy and clinical practice in an effective way such that we can mitigate, adapt, and uh, defend ourselves against the most adverse outcomes that are going to manifest. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so before we go to questions, I, I, I would just like to invite Simon to make a few comments about the experience coming at this from a climate science perspective and having invested um, heavily, I would say, uh, in engaging with the health community. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. So lo last night I was uh, supposed to be thinking about standard errors of correlation coefficients and other horrible esoteric tortures for my uh, students today. And uh, my brain, I'm sure you've had the same problem, my brain was just refusing to focus on what it needed to, and, uh, and it drifted off 
into a, uh, <coughs> for me it was a, uh, probably the most defining moment in, in my career. I'm not going to tell you when it was because that's too embarrassing, but uh, <coughs> many years ago I was invited to a, a workshop uh, in, uh, in Boulder and uh, <coughs> all the famous meteorologists of the time were there, including Ed Lorenz, who uh, <coughs> meteorologists certainly will have heard of. And those of you who haven't, uh, you've probably heard of the butterfly effect and, and chaos. He was sort of the inventor of this. And so he was talking, giving a talk on chaos theory, uh, incredibly complicated uh, topic. And it was one of those brilliant talks where you left <coughs> convinced that you understood everything perfectly. <laughs> everything was so clear uh, in the talk. And I made the mistake when I got back to Johannesburg of letting the Department of Mathematics uh, at the time know that I'd heard this talk uh, of Ed Lowen's. And so they insisted that I give a similar talk to, to them. And it, it was honestly the worst talk I've ever given in my life. I just could not reproduce it. And it really struck home to me how important it is for us to develop the, uh, not only the skills, but the resources that communicate complex issues in simple language that can be understood well beyond your discipline. I'm not saying we've achieved that. It's what we've been, it's what we've been trying to do. And it's, I think it's what we've been trying to do in the IRI as well for the last two decades and more. So with the exception of Lisa, I think I've been at the IRI longer, than, uh, longer than, than anybody else. And we've spent more than two decades, Lisa and I, and, and the other colleagues in my room, at this uh, interface, not just of climate and health, climate and agriculture. We have Walter here sitting, nodding encouragingly to me. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we've been, been working in, in many different uh, uh, cross disciplines. And it surprises me in hindsight that this is the first book that we've written that is targeted at this uh, interdisciplinary space. And <clears throat> of course we need to get your comments back on the book as to how successful it is, but I'd, I'd like to be presumptuous and upfront and say that I, I think it's an important step forwards, that I hope that it makes a valuable contribution in uh, enabling us as different communities, in this case, of course, the climate and the health community, uh, to start understanding uh, each other. I mean, I work primarily with the climate community and especially with national meteorological services around the world. And it's, it's, it's obvious that it is a major challenge for these scientists to be communicating their complex information uh, in ways that are understandable and usable. And so <clears throat> I think there's m tremendous opportunity for more contributions uh, of this nature. And I'm not just thinking about having a book on climate and agriculture or climate and hydrology. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'd perhaps speak to the broader research community in the, in the university as well, that there, there's scope for having books uh, that bridge <coughs> disciplines that don't include climate. Um, because I think, it's, I think it's there that we, that we learn uh, the most clearly uh, and, the most, uh, 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 and the most efficiently. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So um, we now have some time left, I think. Yes. Um, we, can, we, we do have some flexibility built into the schedule, so um, we have an opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. uh, well, thank you for this very interesting panel. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I was mentioning that some of the most interesting things that this book is doing is generating this common language. 
and this communication between health and climate. And he was also using this temporal dimension, explaining how this day by day change on, on weather uh, or uh, on the opposite side, climate change can affect also the design of some health programs or some approaches. But also in this panel was uh, highlighted something that I think that is very important in terms of implementation and is the political cycle. So you were going through uh, extremes in, uh, in this temporal dimension as well, like the political regimes or in other side targeting uh, specific politicians at, at, uh, at, at in the short term. But my question is in the, in, in the, in the between, between the long term, the political regimes, and also the short term politicians, what are those institutional arrangements that can guarantee that this communication between health and climate is going to be translating policies uh, that actually are in, in the well of the, of the society or a particular community? What are what you you want to know what is going to guarantee that that's going to happen, right? I think that comes back to uh, I, I think that's a very broad issue that I'm going to probably answer from a very limited perspective on it. I think one of the things Tamar talked about is communication, uh, and that's been an issue since I started working in the climate and health space. Uh, in 1998, I went to a or 1999, I went to a NOAA sponsored workshop on climate and health. And it was three days long, and it wasn't until the last half of the last day that people actually started talking to each other, and actually, literally being able to communicate to each other. And I actually, I didn't say my background. My background is actually in geophysics. I'm a climate scientist, and I don't know how I wound up here at a health school. But I think, I think we, need to, we need to be able to speak across is the first thing. Getting it into policy is a much more complicated question. We certainly need advocates, I would argue. We certainly need people who are conversant and can actually advocate for policies that are important. But the political difficulties surrounding addressing issues associated with climate change stem well beyond the field, I would argue, just of policy. I don't want to get too philosophical, but there are enormous sociological and tribal issues that actually preclude us acting on things that we should, even though are in our own in best interest. I recently heard a comment from a sociologist who said, the only thing that gets people to act from a sociological perspective is if it is soon, certain, and salient. The three S's, even though it's not. Uh, and the reality is climate, unfortunately, is none of those. And so how do you actually integrate something like that into policy? I would welcome hearing from Tamar and Wilma on, on this because it's an incredibly challenging issue. People have thought, and for instance, the Obama administration thought as part of their thrust in getting involved with us on COP21 side event that we did with them, they were thinking that health would be a really important motivator. You know, you usually hear people vote by their pocketbook and by whether or not they're healthy or not. But it, it hasn't really caught on that way. It's not something that seems to grossly motivate the public to say that, oh, wait a minute, this is gonna be detrimental to mine or my children's health and I need to do something about it. It's not, I agree, soon salient and certain as the problem and for it. So, I mean, it's a great question. Just speaking as, um, as, as, as somebody who's, who's been in a, uh, in a parliament, uh, Politicians would act in, in, in terms of what matters by passing laws, by setting priorities, by allocating budgets, and by uh, responding to their constituencies. That's what they do. So, so you can have high-level policy and in different political systems and different kinds of policy frameworks. South Africa has something called a national development plan. And it's a consensus document that was developed Everybody agrees with the policy directions in that. So that sits up here, and what you want to do is shield that plan from party politics. Say so these, these are national goals. These are not party political goals. These are national goals. There are different ways of achieving that goal, and you want to shield it from party politics. It's very difficult to do, very, very hard. There's no national development plan in the U.S. I mean, it doesn't work that way. It's a federal system. There might be state plans. There might be documents sitting around and what have you. So you can have all manner of plans floating, some better than others, some with local reach, some with regional reach, some with national reach. Uh, 
But when politicians act, they might act on that policy and they may not. They tend to respond to a policy, to an idea. They respond mostly to their constituencies. So the constituencies are active in pursuing certain kinds of policy priorities. They may respond to that. But in the end, what they do is they say, These are the, this is where we're going to head, and let's put money behind it. And that's what, that's what changes the world, right? So that's what made things shift. So, and how you influence that process from the outside is something that also varies. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can be an advocate, you get involved in advocacy, you can agitate on a community level, you can influence through institutions, specialist, expert institutions, and so on. So I'm giving you a um, bit of a vague answer, but, I, but to say that, um, that in the end what matters when it comes to the making of policy is in the framing of laws and in the setting of priorities and the allocate, allocation of budgets. That's what matters. What about those accountability mechanisms themselves through rule of law, through class action lawsuits, right. through other mechanisms that may be Judicial rather than legislative. Right. Those are the forces that act on, on, legis on, on politicians, and they're fundamentally important uh, in, in exacting accountability because citizens must exact accountability, and if that doesn't happen, um, then politicians will very easily stray. So, I mean, it's absolutely important, which is why I would want to emphasize the importance of democratic systems because that enables it. Can I, I'd just like to add something on that the issue around timing. Because um, just thinking back to the whole smoking issue, I was, grew up, you know, I smoked a lot <laughs> and um, uh, stopped at a certain point as the culture shifted. We now live in, an anti, in the West in an anti-cigarette smoking culture, at least. Um, and in the UK, the legislation came in virtually the day after a major fire in the underground caused by somebody dropping a cigarette end in a wooden um, escalator. Uh, that resulted in the deaths of 13 or... So, so many people, and the next day, the anti-smoking lobby went with all the evidence that they had gathered to the Minister of Health and said, this is your window of opportunity while you have the public with you to change the laws and ban cigarette smoking on the underground. So I think opportunity is a really key thing as well, and the timing, when something, you know, there's no such thing as a great crisis to do something good in that crisis, because people are open for a moment, and I just think that the smoking example from the UK is a good illustration of that. Any more questions? Hannah. My question's for, for Wilmot. Um, you said uh, in your um, talk before that politicians were afraid of science or sometimes overtly hostile. I, could you elaborate on that, please? Um, let me tell you the story of what happened to um, uh, something called health diplomacy in American embassies. Is that um, uh, ambassadors suddenly saw on the African continent that um, almost half their budgets were health related, principally through PEPFAR. Right? So a lot of HIV money came through embassies. Um, and the way they dealt with it, because traditionally your, your ordinary ambassador won't in fact touch health because it was just too complicated. They, were, they looked at the numbers, they were confronted with all manner of uh, technical terms, and they would stay far away from it. But when you have half your budget dealing with health, uh, you better come to terms with it. So they got, so the health um, professionals, um, attaches in uh, US embassies, were all from the Center for Disease Control, appointed straight out of CDC, and they were the technical experts. So they built a different system of governance in the embassy, uh, and so on and so forth, and pulled in the experts to deal with, with, uh, with people who are knowledgeable about science and health science. Now, the same is true for members of parliament in South Africa. They, they don't have the technical expertise. Um, many of them, in fact, did not pass high school. And if, and if you think about some of the elected officials, Elected officials, you get what you get, right? Appointed officials, you can have criteria. <laughs> so, um, and often people simply had no science or maths background, so they are terrified of it. 
So, and that's the fear factor, right? And so you have to, you have to deal with that. The hostility comes from, um, from, I made the point earlier about being able to deal with people involved in defense and intelligence. Uh, and often the hostility would come from those hard departments because you're trying, to, you're crossing over when it comes to climate and when it comes to health security, you're crossing over into their territory. And that's the territory of intelligence and territory of defense. And there's a barrier, there's a firewall between that and so on. So often the fear would come from that end. Uh, and then some, sometimes it's just the mundane problems of having uh, corrupt political systems. Is that people have fiefdoms, they've cornered the budget, and here you come with something else. Uh, and so they're just hostile to that. So the whole, the challenge is how do you define the national interest and how do you execute the national interest? Because the natural tendency of people is to be parochial, to be ne nepotistic, to be looking after my own little territory first. And that all adds up into a, uh, a, a, an audience that's not receptive. And the reason why I make that point is that you have to work at it then. It becomes a project. It has to be a project to socialize politicians into the importance of this being in the national interest and so on. And it has been an active project. It's an educational project. It's a breaking down of barriers project. It simply doesn't happen automatically. And you can have advocacy and you can have a lot of activism go on, uh, which is important, but it can also have no consequence unless you do the other part from the inside. Um, I realize that time is against us, and um, so I'm going to stop the questioning now. I'd like you to thank the panel again uh, for one more round. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also now just like to invite Walter Bacon, who is uh, the PI of the Act Today project, to make his uh, comments on uh, what we've been doing here today, and then um, we will invite you. Okay. Good afternoon. So, Richard, you started today with, with uh, an image of a line. And I know now we have a line where I am here, the wine is here, and you want to go there. <laughs> So I'm going to be brief. This was, a, first of all, it was a wonderful meeting. It's really, it was a great idea. I'm glad that, that I was able to be here. Uh, when, when we started working in the project, in the Act Today, and included the dimension of nutrition, I was very squared. And I, and I was asking for direct connection between climate and nutrition. Don't give me the connection through the food, through the food, no. just. What is the connection between climate and nutrition? And people were patient. Shona was very patient. She, Madeline was patient. Richard was patient. And there are, of course, there are direct connections. Pathogens, uh, problems in the storage, salinity with sea level rise. Uh, but as, as Glenn was saying today, when you start interacting with with colleagues from other communities, you learn a lot. Your, open go your mind goes like this. Very, very healthy exercise. I, I come from the agriculture sector, as Simon just mentioned. And I spent most of my life uh, trying to improve the amount of food being produced in different settings through fertilizer use, water, other input genetics. And now, now I realize that in, in all that work, uh, the dimension of nutrients was missing. And, and it made me think a lot about some of the work that has been done in, in the agricultural area. Uh, starting with the Green Revolution, the Green Revolution was a wonderful reaction to a huge threat that the world was confronting in the 50s and 60s. It was wonderful. The, the, a country like India went from being extremely vulnerable to export rice. Now, what happens if we look at the Green Revolution now and after acknowledging how wonderful and fantastic results it had, what happens if we look, consider the Green Revolution now with a nutrient glass? What, 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 was, the, what was the impact of the Green Revolution, what did we really increase? We, we increased a lot of starch. That's the reality. And, and there's a lot of, of other 
nutrients that we didn't take into consideration because, first of all, because the big threat was hunger. And second of all, because it was not in our culture. So if I had to take you to tell you something, one of the most valuable uh, lessons that I get after starting to interact with Shona, Richard, Madeline, and Glenn, is that it, I, I suffered a cultural revolution. So now I'm not thinking just of food, I'm thinking of nutrients. I'm asking the people that are working with us in act today, not, not think of food trade. What happens if you start looking at nutrient trade? And we have a couple of brilliant postdocs that are looking at that. Uh, so the first general comment is that these uh, the activities like this one, the book, are all wonderful efforts to start building this community that we need to that we need to develop if we really want to help make a difference in the, in the nutrient world. Now, a second very short set of comments on, on, on ACT Today. ACT Today, again, is the first Columbia World project that is being implemented in, in the university. The vision of the president of the university for establishing this program was how can we connect all this wonderful knowledge that is generated in the university? How can we link that to the institutions that make a real change in the world? Right? And you know, how can we inform policy? How can we inform development efforts? And one of the things that came to my mind, there's a, a an, theoretical physicist called John Archibald Wheeler. And he, he used to talk about how we live in an island of knowledge surrounded by a sea of ignorance. And he was saying when, when, when that island of knowledge starts growing, the shore becomes bigger. Excuse me? The, the, when, you start, when, when that island starts growing, the shore becomes bigger and bigger, right? So you have more contact with the uh, ignorance. Now, we, we are trying to connect science to, to policy, to decisions. How, think how science has been advancing in the last decades. We're becoming better and better at smaller and smaller fields. So using Wheeler's image, I think what has been happening is we're creating a lot of islands in a sea of ignorance. And decision makers don't jump from island to island. They navigate that sea. So ACT Today is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to connect those islands and generate the knowledge needed for decision making. And, and notice that I, that means that we don't have to forget about the silos. The silos are very important. That's how, that's how science advances. What we need is to connect them. And here is a, it's pulling the air of our education system. Our education systems do not, do not stimulate, promote, the formation of people that are able to integrate knowledge. We're still promoting and, and, and giving prizes to the people that have become very, very good specialists in very, very small areas. If we're serious about informing policy, we have to, one, connect those silence, and that requires communications, patience, a lot of patience. And, and two, be ready to educate people that are able to integrate knowledge from different fields. We witness today, we, we are so used to talking about you, be careful you say climate change and not climate variability. Today, we witness a discussion between Inge and Shona that we have no idea what happened. <laughs> Inge was asking, what do you mean by nutrition? Is diet or is, we don't know. There was a discussion right there happening. We have no idea what they meant. I have no idea what they meant. 
So we need patience. We need patience, we need to communicate, we need to connect. And again, for the, for the education systems, we need to promote the formation of people that are able to integrate also, in addition to the specialists. So I, this, this, first of all, thank you very much for, for organizing this event. I know that it's a big effort for many people. I'm not going to name anybody. Uh, it, it makes me feel, I'm sure you feel the same, Lisa. It makes me feel very optimistic of what we can do with Act Today. We have a wonderful uh, few years in the future to work. But also, like Ruth was saying, uh, you know, we, we leave these activities very happy, very like, you know, like when you leave a locker room going to confront your team in rugby game. Now we have to have action. Now we have to do something. We have to have a concrete plan. We're not going to be able to solve the whole problems related to connection between nutrition and, and climate. Let's focus in a few that we can really advance. And, and I think we can. I think especially the next two days for the for you guys that are involved in the workshops, that's, I think it's a good mandate, a good objective. Let, let's leave those two days with very clear plans, actions. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to um, warmly invite you upstairs to the Hess Common Room. Uh, those of, uh, we need to go back up to the lobby and then uh, down the corridor to your right as you come out of the lift. Yeah, and there's some refreshments there and an opportunity to get to know who you've been spending the afternoon with. And um, for those of you who are participating in the workshop tomorrow, Aisha has been distributing a lot of information to you. So if you get a little bit of chance to read that later this evening, that would be fantastic. But otherwise, thank you for being a great audience. And thanks to, again to all of our panelists and our speaker, Shauna. Thank you. to meet you. I'm sure we'll work together more. Yes, 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 um, yes. We're unfortunately going to have to go, but right, um, we'll right. be in touch on the emails. And yes, it was so nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's not over. Yeah, I know it sounds bad to say that's what I'm no, looking no, forward no, to, no. but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a change perspective.